It is seven o'clock. We'll call this meeting to order. And Superintendent, if you'd please call the roll. President Holt. Present. Vice President Wedge. Present. Clerk Brickler. Present. Trustee Grigsby. Present. Trustee Ross. Present. All right. Thank you. And Vice President Wedge, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> okay, join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I move that we approve tonight's agenda. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing Aye. none. It, oh. I'm so sorry. Is there any way we can move comments up so that we can get students? It's on. Uh, sorry, this is Trustee Ross. I just wanted to see if we can move the comments up to the beginning of the meeting so that people can get to school and stuff on time tomorrow. No. No? Correct. Okay. So, all right. Seeing the agenda was approved. Moving on to item three, special presentations. Justin Carrion is here today to present his annual update to the board on projects completed over the summer and upcoming maintenance goals. I'll do my best. Um, so I'm here to tell you about the summer projects that we've been working on and uh, future projects. Uh, just to let you know what we're doing above and beyond the normal duties of maintenance custodial. Over there. So, you know, we've been, um, <clears throat> sorry. In addition to doing some moving and relocation of maintenance and offices, the uh, our department has been providing um the boxes all the materials labels and instructions on what we needed to do to move for this uh the consolidation um we were um we scheduled and planned supervised the contractors that were doing the move for us which was very helpful we could not have done it folks please stay on this side and not get behind the, the trustees over here Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Stay in, in front of uh, the back. Thank you. And not right behind the superintendent. And I apologize that it's warm. I turned down the air conditioning, but a lot of bodies make a lot of heat. Thanks, everybody. Uh, the consolidation is something we could not have done in house. Uh, there was way too much to do. Um, Alta Vista being transferred over to Blue Door Community. Um, that was a lot of uh, just figuring out what they needed, uh, figuring out what we had to do with our surplus items, and um, giving them support to uh, move their. Um, their program their program along um surplus for district-wide needs are all stored at rock creek now um as well as the programs that we still have going on there uh, and uh preparation of the rooms that were previously used at all sites um we've been maximizing every space that we have so that we can get as many students in there as possible uh, at Evie Kane, we did bottle filling stations, which will uh, eventually be uh, uh, happening at all sites. Um, we have four there. We have one in each gym, one in the sixth grade village, and one on the um, the field, as well as the two that we previously had already. Uh, we had new fencing put in for uh, the visually impaired uh, to make sure that nobody walks down into the amphitheater without knowing they are um truncated domes for the same reason those are all over the school now uh we were 
did the striping and traffic directions uh, for the parking lots, our annual fire uh, sprinkler and inspections, uh, extinguisher inspections. We replaced our backflow uh, this year because it was old and wasn't able to be maintained anymore. And uh, we've been replacing faucets at all schools, but as well as Evie Kane uh, to mitigate um, some lead issues that came up this year. Uh, Auburn Elementary, um, all of our, you know, portables that were not being used, uh, they were updated with new carpet flooring, painted uh, some siding repairs and restroom repairs, uh, the siding and ramp repairs on those portables as well as others uh, that was done. Um, and the painting of those portables. Uh, we moved the compactor that was previously a Rock Creek over to Auburn L to um, accommodate the extra flow of traffic that is there. Um, and that required uh, new electrical uh, shutoffs to be installed. Um, engineered fiber, which is bark, um, that is safe and doesn't uh, splinter. Uh, that was installed um, as well on the playgrounds. Again, with the fire sprinkler and extinguishers, the striping as well, and the faucets, same as the other schools. Um, the preschool was moved over to Sky Ridge this year, um, and there's a, a portable, or sorry, not a portable, um, a um, shed for storage that was added to that site for their storage needs. Uh, again, siding and ramp repairs and the painting that went along with that. There was a couple rooms full, uh, classrooms full of, of uh, unused uh, furniture, chairs, things like that, that were moved off site uh, so they could utilize those rooms. Um, and again, with the same thing on the other schools, the striping, the um, fire inspections and the faucets. Projects that we'll be doing in the future at Sky Ridge, uh, we are, at all schools actually, we are doing our um, trip hazard mitigation on the concrete for any um, uh, elevation change in the sidewalks that is a quarter inch and above to maintain a good uh, non-tripping school situation. Um, the kinder, area has a shade structure that is in desperate need of repair right now it has a band-aid on it to keep it so that it's not an issue for falling on anyone uh, but that is uh, scheduled for um, November break to take care of that um, and uh, water bottle uh, bottle filling stations one in the gym one outside um, in a general area for uh, students and then one in the playground as well. Um, same thing at Auburn L with the concrete trip hazards. Um, <clears throat> in uh, our K2, K2 room, uh, we did have some, um, uh, some mold that was detected. And uh, so that's all being torn out and mitigated as well uh, coming up very soon here. I believe on the uh, same schedule as as the uh, shade structure and water bill, uh, bottle filling stations as well. Same number um, as Sky Ridge 3 in the same kind of locations. Uh, Evie Kane, the trip hazards, um, and we're working on field ir irrigation improvements. Um, and Alta Vista, we're doing, and Rock Creek, we're still doing the trip hazards because they're our sites and they're being used to a degree. Um, a lot of tree work has been done and will continue to be done at Alta Vista because it's just needed to happen for a long time. Um, yeah, Rock Creek is all about storage and our other programs that we have going that don't have, uh, that aren't part of our system, our district, I'm sorry. Uh, new work order system is in place now. Uh, it's called Facility One. Um, our operating system is Unity. We have uh, digital prints of all of our sites. 
Uh, what you're seeing there is an example at EV Kane that shows the first four wings and admin and the Wildcat gym. It, it has a lot of layers to it to, where it'll show plumbing, electrical, um, uh, fire safety needs. Um, and we can, we are and will continue to add layers to that to benefit us. It's a really great system. Um, it, 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 it's great to be able to find things that you need at the site, but it's also an updated uh, work, work order system that everyone's using now. And so far, so good. Uh, the procedure for work orders is that uh, a staff member or anyone can report this to the office and um, that'll be sent in to the system. Uh, we'll review it and assign it to the appropriate person. Um, and then that person working on it, when it's completed, will close it out or hand it back to me if it's not able to be done and we'll outsource if need. Uh, this is just an example of the work order system. It's kind of hard to see on there. Sorry about that. Uh, but it, it does give a lot of information and there's a lot of options for information to be put in there um, that really benefits us. Ta-da, I'm done. <laughs> but if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I have one question for you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, Jason, uh, Vice President Wedge. Um, so my question for you, what are some of the biggest concerns that you're seeing um, as far as uh, facilities wise? Staffing. Yeah, we're still having a hard time getting our appropriate staffing in. Um, substitutes, we are utilizing what we have. Um, and when someone goes out, we don't have someone to fill at this point. So we're stretched a little thin. And you can see it sometimes. Try not to, but when someone goes out and we don't have somebody to, or a person to fill that position, we roll back to the base minimum, which is bathrooms and trash. So sometimes the carpet may not be vacuumed. Uh, the towel flooring might not be mopped um, because there's only so much that one person can do. Thank you. This is Trustee uh, Brickler. And I wanted to just um, go into more detail about that because I was wondering what we could do to support you because I know that um, you know, we're often hearing from staff about um, cleanliness concerns and facilities concerns. And I know that you're, um, whoever is available in your crew works really diligently to get the work done that you can, but what are the constraints that you're facing? So it, could you be more specific about the staffing? You just said staffing, but is it that um, we have vacant positions that we're unable to fill? Um, yes. What, what can you, what, what do you think would make the difference? More people willing to work. I mean, we've we've had a lot of no shows for interviews. Um, people that'll take the position and turn it down before they start. Um, and I don't know. I mean, so perhaps the wages one. aren't competitive. Sure. In part. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that we're terribly. It, it would help. We're trying to be more, more competitive, money. but that's a obviously a. But yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge just to get somebody on board and keep them. And I think back to, um, sorry, if I could, if I could add to that, um, CBO Leslie, um, it, and he mentioned before the substitutes, and I know that's something that we're feeling in all areas besides custodial. And so it's really, really hard to get those substitutes in. And um, that's really what we lean on when we have anybody that's taking a vacation or if they're sick or anything like that. And when, like you said, they're out and we just don't have a substitute to come in. And then we're just left kind of shuffling with who we have. So are there some opportunities? This isn't a long-term fix, but for the community to work on a project together or to do some cleanup on a site, like, um, well, I mean, I, it would have to be negotiated. It, it, yeah. As long as it's acceptable to the union, we'll take it to help. Uh, but it's more of a day-to-day -day that I had a group of parents that were ready to, you know, band together and help with the Sky Ridge um, kindergarten area shade structure. I mean, I think there's there are times where people are willing to pitch yes, in. Yes, but we are we are limited on what we can accept yeah. as help. Um, right, skilled labor. Right. 
should weight go to our page. bearing, yeah, structures and things yeah. like that, safety. Um, I have one more question, which is, um, could you update us on the status of the fix, the plumbing fixtures and the flushing process? Because it was my understanding that, uh, is there a reason why some fixtures have been installed but haven't been flushed yet? Is there a, is there a reason yeah. why we have to wait until all fixtures are installed at a site in order to start the flushing process? There, there was a wait, um, and mainly mm -hmm. because of our staffing issues and just consistency. I wasn't I wasn't confident that we wouldn't miss something if we didn't wait a little bit for it all to be completed, which it is, and it's in the flushing process now. Um, we had to, uh, last week, so we have another three weeks of flushing. We have to retest again. It should all come out fine and dandy, but at, you know we have to wait for that test to find out what the next step is. Hopefully, it's pull the red tags off, use the water. It's all great. But so there was a concern that. that this there wouldn't be staff available to kind of check back and ensure that a particular fixture was cleared if if they had been done individually. I yeah. Are you talking about my concern with that? Um. Well, I think there are some that could be operation. It could have already been operational. There. Yes. We but we're but we're holding back until. Long, so. Yes, that's, that's true. Okay. I was I was just going for uniformity and um, consistency okay i know i know that folks are just really eager to be able to have um you know especially the younger grades <laughs> be able to wash their hands in classroom i mean at, at any at any grade level really but i yeah completely respect that yeah okay yeah. thanks um trustee ross i i really want to go back to sarah brickler's uh original question of how we can support and the cleanliness it is about to be flu season if not already get out the word if you know of anyone that wants to work i have positions available um i just can't get everything done without the people to do it 100 so. percent. and we want to is there any um is there any way ptc or parents could come in and help scrub tables or is that like that please don't touch it for the union. gotcha yeah. okay Thank you. Anything else? I think that's it. You're off the hook. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Chris, have a great night. I'm you out. too. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> All right. Moving on to item four. Uh, and that's going to be public comment on anything not on tonight's agenda. Yes, we have several. Okay. <clears throat> great. First is Yoretti Perez. Okay. And just a quick reminder before we get into those um, three minutes and it's seven individual speakers after that we can add those to the end of tonight's meeting after we get through the rest of the agenda no, you're thank you no, you're fine. dear board members my name is Yuretsi Soto I'm the president of Auburn Elementary I'm here be I address you with great respect <coughs> I'm here because I ha I haven't seen a single good change since you guys closed the Rock Creek. What was the purpose of Rock Creek of closing Rock Creek? If you guys said it would improve the budget, but right now I'm not seeing any changes. So I'm asking if you can help. My president, my principal, is trying her best to help the students, but without the resources, staff and you guys, it's hard for her. Another thing that has been causing a problem is traffic. Whenever I come to school, I see multiple cars, even more cars than at Rock Creek. I care about every single school and their needs. Another thing I would like you to add are taller gates and bilingual teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Rita Henriquez. Rita. There will be interpretation uh, from Spanish to English. Buenas noches. <clears throat> Siempre. Vamos a la segunda ronda o a la segunda tanda. Ahora no sabemos hasta dónde vamos a llegar. 
Good evening. We come to the se second round, or I don't know how many rounds we will have. Como se ve el panorama ahorita, o como se ve la agenda, rumores. The way it looks right now and the way the agenda looks, uh, it's just rumors. Iremos a terminar sin escuelas en el distrito, no sabemos. We may end up with no schools at the district, who knows. Buenas noches, personal del distrito, representante del comité. Good evening, school uh, district staff and representatives of the committee. Me dirijo a ustedes con todo respeto. I come to you with all respect. Para hacer del conocimiento de la, algunas necesidades que yo sé que hay en la árbol elementaria. To bring to your knowledge some needs that need to be covered. I know this, are hap this is happening at Auburn Elementary. Por favor, tomen en cuenta nuestras voces como padres de familia. We ask you to please take into consideration our voices as, as parents. Escuchen nuestra voz. Hear our voices. Si los padres que estamos aquí es porque nos interesa la educación de nuestros hijos. The parents here, we are here because we are interested on our children's education. Queremos un buen futuro para nuestros hijos. We want a better future for our children. Queremos buena educación. We want good education. La inversión, hagámoslas en el personal docente. We need to invest uh, with the teachers and staff. Hagámoslo en asistentes, porque la escuela está necesitando asistencia. We need to provide assistance. Uh, the school needs assistance. En primer lugar, en esta escuela estamos ocupando un asistente como directora o su directora. First of all, we really need a uh, assistant for a for the principal. Ocupamos una supervisión de policía para que esté en la hora de recoger nuestros estudiantes. We also need more police supervising during a uh, children pickup. ¿Por qué? Muchos padres de familia faltan el respeto al personal docente que está dirigiendo el tráfico. The reason is because many parents are actually being disrespectful to the staff and while they are directing traffic. Necesitamos ayudas en las aulas. Necesitamos asistentes. We need help in the classrooms. We need assistance. Inviertan en maestros, en asistente, en material. We ask you to invest in assistance, aid, teachers, materials. Porque no está siendo fácil una transición en nuestra escuela. Because it's not an easy transition in our school. No es fácil por mi propia vida personal, lo estoy pasando con mi niña. A ella, de camisa rosada, la invito que deje su escritorio, deje su oficina y váyase un día o una semana a la escuela I invite you, the one a trabajar. I invite you, the one wearing a pink shirt, I invite you to leave your desk and leave your office and come and work at our school for at least a week. A trabajar como personal administrativo, como directora o como docente. Come and work as a administrative staff or a principal or teacher. Porque me dijo una vez en el Facebook. Because I was told, you told me once in que, Facebook. Que en vez de estar discutiendo, quisiera una transición armoniosa. That instead of arguing, I should make more harmonious transition. Pero no se está dando. But it's not happening. ¿Por qué? Why? Padres de familia que no están de acuerdo que nuestra directora de la Rock Creek esté trabajando en el árbol elementario. Any parent that is not agreeing with the principal working at our elementary school. Llegaron, le dijeron malas palabras. They came in, they were rude. A la directora, al personal docente. They were rude to the teachers, Al personal administrativo. Rude to the administrative staff. ¿Qué culpa tiene nuestro personal de la Rock Creek estar aguantando los padres del árbol elementario? What is the Rod Creek's personnel or the Rod Creek's staff? Uh, what is their fault uh, of what is going on at the other elementary school? Si no les parece cómo está haciendo el trabajo nuestra directora, saquen a sus hijos de ahí. If o como superintendente, la invito. If they don't like the way our principal is doing her job, then move your kids to another school. Uh, a, to you, the superintendent, I invite you. Que aclare el motivo cuál fue la renuncia de la directora de la Arbun Elementary. To please clarify what was the reason of the, the reason why the principal at the uh, Auburn Elementary quit. ¿Por qué? Si ellos no están de acuerdo como nuestra directora está trabajando. Because if they don't agree on how our principal is working. Ellos pensarán que la, la directora del Arbun Elementary fue corrida. They may think that the principal at Auburn Elementary 
deben de aclarar ese punto como pa a los padres de familia de la Album Elementary y que dejen trabajar a la directora de la Rock Creek, ex Rock Creek. You need to notify the parents of the reason why and why that principal left the elementary and come and talk to the parents at Rock Creek. Que haga su trabajo como ella lo está haciendo. And for, um, to let her do the job however she's doing it. Tengo ocho años como madre de familia de la Rock Creek. I've been a parent as Rock Creek for eight years. Y he conocido cuatro directoras y de las cuatro directoras, la que está en el álbum elementary es la mejor que he conocido. And I have met and seen four principals. And out of those four, the one actually running is the best. Por ejemplo, la escuela de la álbum elementary, tengo fotos. For example, the Auburn Elementary School one, I have pictures. Donde toca el kinder, tiene una pasarela de agua. I think that was time. That was that six was minutes. minutes. That was six minutes. Le dieron thank you. Seis minutos de tiempo, se acabó. Pero me pueden permitir otro momento? No, you thank you. No, thank you. Kristen Dutro. Lo siento mucho, pero quedo I'm con sorry. mucho que decir. I still have a lot to say. Kirsten Dutro. Um, Superintendent, can I just make a request that we get a copy, Kirsten, a copy of these comments? Because I don't think we heard them all so or seen them. If they provide it to us, yes. If okay. they choose not to provide it, then we don't have word for word. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Kirsten Dutro. I've been a science teacher at Evie Kane for the past 22 years. The Auburn Union School District has experienced a lot of change in the last year. And although we have closed two of the five schools that Auburn Union once had, the sentiment to keep Evie Kane a true middle school has not changed. Staff, parents, and most importantly, students want to attend the type of school that offers what Evie Kane can. Ask any sixth, seventh, and eighth grade student at Kane if they would like to attend a K-8 next year, and 95% of them would say no. If you decide to change Kane to a K-8, Auburn students would most likely lose advanced math classes, honors English, twice as many elective options, an all-encompassing instead of a divided band program, competitive athletic teams in the FISA League. Two-thirds of Auburn students would miss out on attending a school that has two gyms, a large blacktop and field, and having any athletic teams at all because there would be no other teams to compete against. They would miss out on dedicated art classes, computer and technology rooms, and science classrooms, unlike regular looms, which have four sinks, 20 electrical outlets, counters on all three sides, and a storage science room. In the 22 years I have been working at this district, K-8s have been tried twice, once at Sky Ridge and once at Alta Vista. Both failed. Why? Because the students want to attend Evie Kane. So does it make sense to deny close to 500 12, 13, and 14 year olds the educational enrichment and life experiences that a middle school can offer? All to save $400,000. Which by the way, won't be that much once you pay to retrofit cane with better fencing for safety, little kid bathrooms, and playgrounds. Is this 400,000 worth the continued instability and chaos that another year of big changes would bring to this district? How many students and families would we lose when we can't offer a middle school option to set us apart from the generic K-8s that already surround us. Chaos and instability caused the community to lose faith in the district as a stable institution to educate students. This sets up a chain reaction of teachers leaving, teachers leaving causes students to leave, students and families leaving cause us to leave money, and so on and so on and so on until we are where we are right now. I know that getting Auburn Union financially solvent three years out is an issue that needs to be solved. But big changes that severely strip and prevent not only Kane, but Auburn Elementary and Sky Ridge's ability to establish normalcy and calm for yet another year is not the right answer. Right now, currently the district is solvent for this year and next, and we should be using this time to discover other options. Options that should include getting a second accounting opinion from an independent firm that might see things from a different lens and would most likely provide another outcome to help create a more positive outlook for the future of Auburn Union School District. I think the least we can do is go back to putting students at the heart of every decision. Thank you.
when, when you selfie know. whittle excuse me um before we get to the next one this is for uh this period is for public comment for items not on the agenda so if there are further um discuss, uh, public comment regarding ev cane and going to tk8 or remaining in middle school please save that for agenda item 8f thank you Good evening, President Hold, school board members, and interim superintendent Lucci Garcia. We stand here together tonight to voice our concerns about the safety and well-being of our campus, Auburn Elementary School. We are concerned that our campus is not getting the support it needs for students and staff to be successful this school year. The interim superintendent has asked us, what do you need? Our staff has shared our concerns and ideas on several occasions. Unfortunately, no action has been taken to address these pressing needs for our campus. We are here to share our concerns with you tonight so you can take action to provide the support that is needed to our campus. Many classes still do not have running water in their classrooms because their faucets and our drinking fountains have been found to contain lead. We must have clean running water in all rooms. A few of our outdoor water fountains work, but the majority either have low pressure or simply do not work. It is unacceptable that students do not have access to drinking water at recess and in their classrooms. As you know, this goes against board policy. Our campus needs sufficient admin support and an increase in supervision to ensure safety for our students and staff. After consolidating two schools into Auburn L's campus, there are currently 546 students at Auburn L. Auburn L has one full-time principal who is working tirelessly to support our students and staff. We have double the amount of students on campus compared to last year, yet we have the same amount of admin support. The district needs to add a vice principal to our campus. This will provide more admin support to deal with discipline and safety, as well as allow our admin the opportunity to make much needed connections with students, which will result in less discipline issues. Our school site will be without an admin for seven days this school year. Rather than pay our principal for the time she spent moving school sites this summer, the district has directed our principal to take seven comp days. Classroom teachers who do not have administrative credentials have been asked to fill in while our principal takes these comp days. This will leave our students with a substitute rather than their classroom teacher during this time and our campus without an admin. The district needs to provide our campus with an admin while our principal takes these seven comp days rather than pay substitutes to pull teachers from their classes. It is imperative that we have an administrator on campus at all times as well as have more, more support from the district to deal with extreme behavior on our campus. An example of this occurred a few weeks ago when a student injured nine staff members, two of which went to the hospital and caused a, lock, a lockdown on campus. Thankfully, no students were harmed. We have grave concerns about the safety of students and staff if adequate support is not provided immediately. We respectfully ask that you provide the, that you provide the support needed to make our campus safe and successful this year. Access to clean and drinkable water, the addition of a vice principal, an admin on our campus at all times, and provide support for extreme behaviors. This is not a site problem. This is a district problem. Thank you. Shirley Paris. Good evening, board. My name is Shirley Paris. I no longer work for you. I am currently retired and working tirelessly on bringing back uh, training our dedicated history staff at Evie Kane to do a 22nd year Renaissance Fair. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kim Casbear, who has worked tirelessly. I do mean tirelessly. She's at home right now vetting parents for fingerprinting and such, which is a new um, new overlay for us. Um, so I come here tonight to remind you that part of the reason that we have been successful is because there is no one that does a Renaissance Fair. Other districts come to us and ask, can we join you this year? Newcastle Elementary will be joining us. Um, Weimar was going to join us until it turned out they had a, a professional development day. Um, so our K-8s around us can't provide a Renaissance Fair, which is a unique experience that puts Auburn on the map and um, even our junior highs. So because of our dedicated staff and uh, our, our district office, we are going to provide a Renaissance Fair. And I am here to invite you to see firsthand what it is that we do 
in one day of stepping back in time and how we bring community. I have Kiwanis members. I have Lions members. I have Rotary members. I have the community who is supporting us in making sure that this historical day in history happens at Evie Kane. So here's our timeline and our extraordinary um, presenters. Um, and I, I welcome you and invite you. Thank you. Emily Mockle. No problem. No problem. There we go. Is this yours? Yeah, here you go. Um, my name is Emily Mockle. Um, I am a community member. Um, I do not have any children that are I'm a guardian or a parent of, but I work with multiple children in our school system. Um, and parents come to me to ask me where their kids should go to school. Um, being a nanny and working with the Auburn Parks Department, teaching classes and working with families in general. And I have worked really hard the last year um, with the teachers and with the community to run community events for our children. And it disheartens me to see that our staff, our teachers, our administrators, our parents, our kids are hurting. They're hurting really bad um, with the combining of the schools. A lot of my kids that I do watch have chosen to leave the district due to the inconsistency um, of funds and the future of our school district. And as a homeowner and as a community member, that's disheartening. Um, I've been to plenty of board meetings. Um, I've seen teachers and just to see their hearts broken, um, rumors that are actually true about our children not being safe on campus because they don't have the resources is not an acceptable thing for me. Um, so I'm here today to stand in um, solidarity with our staff and our teachers and with our parents, because I believe that needs to be changed and it needs to be changed as soon as possible. Closing our schools is not an acceptable answer. Um, and so I want to see what the board and the district is willing to do to support our children as every one of these staff members have their, on the back of their shirts, it says child and it's surrounded by a heart. Our children are the heart of this community and our future, and we need to do something to make sure that continues. Thank you. Victor Allen Weeks. Appreciate y'all for having me. My name is Victor Allen Weeks. It's good to see the overwhelming support in here, um, standing in solidarity with y'all educators for standing up for the youth, for standing up the community. Um, everybody in here, everybody in here has been taught by somebody else. Am I right? Whether it's directly or indirectly. And when you have educators or people that care about your development, um, you trust that they're doing the best or they're doing what's in the best interest for the development of the youth, for the development of you, right? So that's what these educators are here doing. That's what the student is here doing, advocating for something that they believe in that's important to them, that's imperative for them, that's imperative for the success and longevity of this space that's here, that we're here, that we're stewarding from other folks that have stewarded this land for thousands of years. So uh, when you hit that convergent point, that converging point, you have to make a decision. Are we gonna listen to the folks that are echoing all of these voices are echoing something that's critical for their well-being, for their wellness. Um, and you don't, we don't exist in silos. If it affects them, it's going to affect all of y'all. It's going to affect all of us. And it just comes to a point where you got to decide, are we going to follow or are we, we going to lead? How are we going to lead? And so um, leaders know when to listen. Leaders know when to make decisions that they may not agree with but it represents the common interests of the folks that they're representing. So I'm just, excuse me here as a passer through, passer by. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? 
So I'm just here with Victor Allen. I just wanted to share those words. Appreciate y'all being here. And keep making sure your voices are heard. Uh, real talk. So appreciate it. Thank you. Bristol Scanlon. Excuse me, Kirsten. I think that was number seven. What I was believe, that? I believe that was our seventh speaker. Oh, oh, so, okay. I wasn't counting. Since someone's yes. been called, can we allow them to? I'm, I'm afraid not. We're going to continue with tonight's agenda. So it, it, it wasn't counted. So um, moving on then to uh, item 5A, AUTA comments. Mm -hmm. All right, and moving to item 5B, uh, CSEA comments, if we have any tonight. It doesn't look like it. All right, and to item 6, comments from the board and superintendent. This is Superintendent Lucci Garcia. I just want to um, um, share our excitement that we found another English teacher for E.B. Kane. Um, we also have received some uh, more applications for paraprofessional positions and other classified positions um, because we went ahead and advertised for positions on um, social media through the HR department. Um, and then I had the opportunity this week and actually this year in an ongoing um, ongoing way to read to Mrs. Robinson's kindergarten class. She has invited me in there. And um, so I've been able to um, read to kindergarten students and then um, watch them do some really cool kindergarten math. So that's my update. Great. Thank you. Uh, so according to comments I've heard tonight, uh, this is President Holt, um, comments I've heard tonight, um, other comments I've heard recently, um, things have been coming up with Auburn Elementary. Uh, Superintendent, it really sounds like you need to spend more time focusing on the leadership at that school site. Because if there's a failure at that school site, ultimately it does come down to you. Uh, so I hope that you will spend more time and more attention with Auburn Elementary. Um, you know, and then what we're going to uh, discuss tonight, um, it comes down to we need to maintain the financial health of this district so we can maintain a school district. So um, decisions about um, any potential layoffs, about any schools changing structure, all the rest, none of those are personal decisions. That's going to be rooted in whether or not we can maintain a district to have uh, local control of that district, because otherwise we will lose it. So um, that's uh, that's the comments I have for tonight. So moving down, if anybody else has anything. Um, I'll get a reserve mine. Uh, this is uh, Clerk Brickler, and I just I um, I think that we could make our board meetings a more welcoming environment to the public. We are all elected to serve our Auburn community, and we very infrequently have um, guests. We infrequently have speakers, and I don't appreciate the um, I don't know. Just I, I feel like we're we're we can bend the rules as a board in order to accommodate the public and in order to welcome their comments. And I'll leave it at that and pass it on. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really excited about the Jogathon coming up this uh, Friday. Um, I, I'm sad that I'm just now finding out about, out about the Renaissance Fair this Friday because if, if I could go to both of them, I would absolutely try. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a really exciting Friday. Good start for the weekend. Um, this is Trustee Ross. And um, to my fellow comrades that sit on this board with us, I I really hope that you show up in the, the classrooms that we are making policies for so we know what type of policies we're making and how that affects our students. Um, it's, it's, there's a, there's, I feel a big disconnect between our leaders 
and the schools that we serve. And we made a big, big, big decision to consolidate a school. And I don't know that any one of you have been there at Auburn Elementary to sit. I understand we have jobs. I have two jobs. I'm a single mom and I still find time to show up at not only Auburn Elementary, but show up at Evie Kane and show up at Sky Ridge so that I know that the decisions I make that are affecting these students are actually the reflections that should be made. It's really hard to make a decision when you don't know what's going on in the classroom. And I understand the difference between weeds and, and being the why and being the what, I get it. But how do we make a decision for children that we don't know? And so I am begging of you to please show up in these classrooms, show up as yard duties, show up in whatever capacity you can show up so that you can see how the decisions we make are affecting these people. All right, moving on to item seven then, the consent agenda. And is there anything anybody wanted to pull on that? Yes. All right, Vice President Weich, what is that? I just want to pull two items for a quick um, clarification discussion. That would be F1 and um, item G. This is Clerk Brickler, and I would also like to pull F2, please. All right. And anything else? All right. Then I move to approve the consent agenda with the exceptions of item F1, G, and F2. I'll second. All right. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. All right. And then Vice President Wedge, you'd start us with item F1. <laughs> So as I was reviewing this, going over this, um, just a quick uh, clarification on this. Um, so are these, from what I'm understanding, um, we're actually paying um, to close out past projects in the past that was not properly closed out. And how far um, does this go back? Um, CBO Leslie, um, yes, you're absolutely correct. So um, these are projects that span all the way back to, and I'd, I'd really have to look at this, but we're even looking at the um, late 80s um, and mid 80s on some of these projects and specifically early 90s. Um, these were all modernization or construction projects that took care, that took place in the district. And um, in years past, there used to be um, a lot of districts that would do these construction projects. Um, they have to get the approval for Division of State Architect. Um, they also have to be uh, certified through the Division of State Architect. And many districts uh, skip that last step in a lot of in a lot of ways. So this has been this was kind of a hot button issue um, a few years ago um, in school construction. And what we found here um, with Auburn Elementary, um, not Auburn Elementary, but Auburn Union, is that we have quite a few of outstanding projects that were just left uncertified. Um, the unfortunate part of that is that does um, leave us liable. It also hampers future uh, construction or modernization on those sites. And uh, because we're talking about, you know, different things and, you know, how we want to modernize things or down the road or anything like that, um, these actually stand in the way. Um, so yeah, they were just uncertified at the time. Thank you. This is Clerk Brickler. And I was wondering from an accountability standpoint, who is ultimately responsible for the to the closeout to complete the project with DSA? Um, it really depends on the project. Um, typically, we put a lot of that on whoever the architect of record would have been at the time. Um, those are usually ones that we kind of, as a standard rule, um, if I were doing the construction, I would hold back the final payment until um, we received certification from Division of State Architect. What they did in the past, I don't know. Um, so this would have been whomever was conducting the um, the construction projects or the modernization projects at the time and ensuring that, you know, all the forms were received from project inspectors, architects, and contractors. But it's been so long at this point that it would be hard to go back to Lardner. Or I'm trying to remember some of the names. Yeah. Um, some of the names that are very familiar on this list 
to say this project was never fully closed out. Absolutely. There's a kind of a statute of limitations of being able to go back and ask for their assistance. Um, not really, but um, I have in the past um, when I've consulted with other districts throughout the state, um, tried to go back on prior architects and they feel that they're, they've done what they can on this. And sometimes we find that architects aren't even in business anymore. Um, so that's why we utilize our arch current and approved architects of record um, mm -hmm. to kind of walk us through this process because it can be very detailed. Um, and that allows them to step in as architect of record and finish off any um, design concerns or work with inspectors or contractors if needed. I happen to be talking to a uh, former superintendent and I understood that often it's the chief business officer that is kind of ultimately responsible to make sure that this happens for that time period that they're overseeing a project. But I'm hearing you say that it should be the architect of record. Well, ultimately, I mean, you want whomever yeah. is conducting that project. So if there would have been um, a construction manager or a facilities person at that time, or if the CBO at the time had been doing that, that's possible also. Um, it's Like I said, usually it's, it's them to make sure that all of these things kind of get put in. I typically would lean on my architects if it if it had been a project that I had run. Okay. I guess I was just asking because I was trying to figure out, it seemed like this, a lot of the projects were um, late 80s, mid 90s. I mean, these are massive projects. I wanted to clarify, one member of the public had asked, there, there are these dollar amounts in the spreadsheet. And I was trying to clarify that those are not, that's not what we are um, subject to pay to close this out. That was the estimated cost of the project at the time. Correct. What we're paying is the hourly rate for the architectural staff um, to do the work, to file the paperwork, to try to remedy these outstanding items. Correct. And so this is, this is really, um, again, their proposal and, and each one will be different. We may find some that we just have to write a letter um, you know, if it was a portable that was placed somewhere and it's no longer there, we just have to write a letter as a district saying it's no longer here and they certify it. They've changed a lot of the regulations and what they allow. Um, we may have to pay for an inspector to come out and reinspect something. Each project will be a little bit different. But yeah, they they are actually, if you look at it, it's pretty much any of the new constructions, modernizations or additions that's happened in the district. Sorry, what do you mean it's happened? It, like it's in any. <laughs> What? Anything that's happened in the district as far as construction or modernization has not been certified. Okay, and unfortunately, even, even in the more recent history, because it seemed like it was more like the 90s era project. A lot of them are, but I mean, that is our most recent history. We haven't had any massive new construction or modernization since then. Right. So I think um, our largest project would have been uh, the modernizations that happened at Rock Creek, and those were uncertified as well. And again, this is something that, you know, it's not unusual to see in a school district. It's something that had been on um, people's radars. Um, the prior master plan that was not board adopted, but that had been drafted uh, by JK Architects. Um, it also discussed some of these uncertified projects. I think it's something that had just been kind of put on a back burner as far as priority. Um, I just think with the options of liability and the connotations of liability on our current board members, um, in, you know, should we even want to go forward with you know, like a shade structure that was mentioned before. Um, these are all things that the state could say, you haven't even certified X on site. So you need to do that first. So it's just something it's, it's not going to fix in 30 days. It's just something we're going to move forward and start chipping away at. Trustee Ross, you had mentioned shade structures. And so what is it going to take for us to be able to move forward on something like that at this point? Um, so if we were going to move forward on something like that, um, we're wrapping up our accessibility survey, which should give us an idea of um, what things would have to take place in order to install shade structures at individual sites. Um, with that and the estimations, um, we can move forward to see if that's something that any of these projects would cause a roadblock on it. Um, and then we would get a full estimation and then we would have to move forward with the project. So. Um, I would say if it's for summer, we'd have to get something into Vision State Architect probably by like January. And is that a request as board maker, board members we would make, or is that something that's already shade structures already in being established? Um, it was inclusive in the ESSER 3 plan. Right. Um, so that's kind of the reason why we're, we utilize the ESSER funds for that accessibility study to kind of see what it would take. And if it's something that we're a even able to go forward with, if we have enough money in that plan. So we may find that it becomes cost prohibitive at certain sites. Um, and it might be easier to install in others. Thank you. Are there any additional clarifying questions on F1?
Um, I'll move that this is Clerk Brickler, and I'll move that we approve item F1. Um, Vice President Wedge, I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, it carries. And then Vice President Wedge, item G. Can we have F2 pulled as well? Yes, I was just okay, okay, gotcha. right there. So let me open this up. So I think on Evie Kane, something that caught my eye as I was going through this on page 10 on that. Um, let me get to it real quick. It talks about uh, student enrollment by grade level. And I noticed for the 22-23 school year um, for grade five, there was one student for grade five. And I found that kind of, um, it didn't, didn't fit in with anything else that I was seeing. Correct. So um, during that year, that was deemed the best placement for that student. Okay. And without breaching confidentiality, that's pretty much what I can say. Copy. Do you have any additional questions on that one? Nope. This one's good. Okay. Uh, this is President Holt. I move that you approve item G. So G. Vice President Wedge, I'll second that. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, it carries. Aye. And Clerk Brickler, item F2. Uh, so I was, why well, I'm rereading this item as a ratification. So the agreement has already been completed. Um, I, I guess it looked like initially the purpose of the agreement was to estimate TK enrollment and to project what numbers we might see. Um, but what seems like the more pressing matter is to understand that if we were to you know, change models to a TK8 at three sites, that it would be imperative that we have uh, the ability to change boundary lines and that um, understanding how to balance um, uh, three schools with that formula would be kind of the most critical need that we would have. So I, I guess I was just kind of wondering if this item could be placed on hold until we know whether or not that's the direction that we're moving in as a board. Um, it seems like that the TK projection, um, so this is about a $5,000 study and the TK projection, we already have seven months worth of data. We could kind of estimate generally how many TK students we may have. Um, I guess I just wanted to hold off on this item if we could until we know the outcome of the vote later regarding whether we will pursue a three TK8 model. But it sounds like it's it's been routed. It's already been signed. So what options do we have if that's not a need? Um, well, this is CBO Leslie. So um, the demographic studies and the information is, is kind of a key component for a few different things. And that's why it utilizes the restricted funding. So aside from looking at projections, besides just what's coming in from TK right now, they also analyze um, any current construction or future construction um, that's still viable, in addition to allowing us to have a look at really where students are coming from and where they're going to, as we did with the prior demographic study. We held it off last year um, just because we were in the midst of so many changes. And so we're actually kind of catching up two years of demographic information. Um, in me, so the, the, what, the report that we reviewed as part of the FRIP committee was, right. two, was a year old at that point? Yes. Okay, so, so it's been... I said it was, so it was um 21 when we had the yes the study completed before I think so or early 22 so we're coming into the 23 24 fiscal year so, so ideally one would have this done annually if we could afford it yes so I mean that's yeah. that's really the goal but now we're we're kind of at that cross point where we really want to start looking at um, you know, getting the information and as much technical as we can, not only for what it looks like for attendance boundaries, even if we were not to go to a TK-8, if we wanted to adjust those as we had discussed um, with the original consolidation after the first year looking at attendance boundaries, um, that's also key. Um, a third piece of this is as it was at the, FIC, the FICMAT report um, that we are um, well behind in having an adopted uh, facilities master plan, an updated one. Um, this would also be a key component that we would want to include in a facilities master plan. So this would allow us to kind of, again, chip away at that little piece ahead of time and make use of something um, for, free, for like three different purposes in one. Thank you. Would you mind explaining what you were the sec I think it was like the second piece of information, the second purpose that you had mentioned? 
Are you talking about you, the thick mat plan? No. Um, I thought FICMAT was really related to the facilities master plan. Yes. Okay. Just rewind before that. You were talking about, even if we don't choose to go TK8 at three schools, you were talking about boundary changes? Um, it had been a discussion previously when we had um, consolidated the schools that um, we wanted to see as a district and the board wanted to see if that was something that could be looked at in order to adjust attendance areas between uh, Sky Ridge Elementary and Auburn Elementary to see if there might be any need to relieve pressure. We were looking at if, you know, we ended up with about 300-ish um, at Sky Ridge, which was originally thought, you know, and then we ended up with like 580, which was originally thought at Auburn Elementary. Would that be something we'd want to look at? So um, it gives us a good opportunity to kind of peek into that window as well. It's tricky, right? Because we both have boundary lines, yet we also try to honor school choice as much as we can. So I don't know how influential the boundary line changes are to families because they, it seems like we're trying to accommodate them wherever they would right. like to go. It ends just kind of being like a backstop. I mean, because obviously we honor school of choice and have been a school of choice district um, for at least 20 years. Um but ultimately, if a school is impacted and there is no more room, um, then that's where we have to say, I'm sorry, you know, we, we unfortunately just don't have space at this school. And then we have to revert back to the homeschool. So depending on the outcome of this evening's discussion and possible vote, might you adjust what school works focuses on, whether it's on, on which boundary lines? Get. Um, well, the boundary work would be something almost separately. So this is updating the demographics. And then if we actually go in to start carving and looking at attendance boundaries, we can give them a few scenarios and then they can work on that for us. So it's, it's, it's kind of flexible. Okay. Thank you. Those were my questions related to that item. Just wanted to see if we had any flexibility. So um, with that being said, I will move that we approve um, item F2. This is President Holt, and I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. <clears throat> okay, moving to item 8A. And before we get started, is there any public comment on 8A? <coughs> the approval? Okay, none. Okay. Okay, um, due to the change in administration, it is necessary that we update our designation of representative for the school's insurance group, Joint Powers Board. Administration recommends approval of Resolution 2324-003, designation of representative for school's insurance group, Joint Powers Board. And are there any questions on that? Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is President Holt. I move that we approve item 8A. Clerk Brickler, I second. And since it's a resolution, I will take the roll call vote. Um, President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Uh, Trustee Grigsby. Aye. And Trustee Ross. And the motion carries. Okay. Moving to item 8B. Acceptance of Sunshine Proposal from AUTA to AUSD. Government code requires that meetings and negotiating shall not take place on any proposal until a reasonable time has elapsed after the submission of the proposal to enable the public to become informed and allow the public the opportunity to express itself regarding the proposal at a meeting of the public school employer. AUTA is submitting their initial proposal for reopeners for 23-24 school year for collective bargaining between AUTA and the district. Um, administration recommends approval of the acceptance of the Sunshine proposal from AUTA. This is President Holt. I do have a question then. So we're not saying that this is the starting point. I mean, we're opening negotiations, but the things that are on their proposal, that's not, those aren't kidneys, correct? Right, so your approval is just a, um, approval that you that you receive this and you approve of their, what they put in front of you, everything else gets bargained. And then we'll come back to you in some form for approval for each item that's bargained. So you are not approving of the list that they have attached here. 
just that they have attached the list and 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 that you have it got it all right is there any other are there any other questions on that seeing none this president hold i move that we approve item 8b acceptance of the sunshine proposal vice president wedge i'll second that all those in favor aye aye, aye. and those opposed seeing none it carries and moving to item 8c so the same government code requirement um, um, also allows for um, a, this reasonable time that that reasonable time has been has elapsed and that the public has had an opportunity to see the proposal from AUSD to AUTA as part of their sunshine administration recommends approval of the sunshine proposal from AUSD to AUTA. Again, this is President Holt, I move that we approve item 8C, approval of the Sunshine proposal. Clerk Brickler, I second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, it carries. <clears throat> Moving to item 8D, approval of resolution 23-24-04, elimination of confidential position, human resources. Okay. Um, from the Board of Trustees request at the September 13th, 2023 board meeting, any actionable fiscal reduction proposals were to be brought forth for board action on the October agenda. As such, this resolution represents the proposed elimination of confidential position number 19, effective July 1st, 2024. Administration recommends approval of resolution 23-2404, elimination of confidential position. Clerk Brickler, I have a clarifying question. Um, is there a, a reason why this needs to be addressed at this point in time, I think typically when we're unable to fund a position moving forward, that often takes place on a different timetable. It happens, you know, in March, for example, by the, the deadlines to notify staff um, of, um, I'm trying to rem remember the verbiage, essentially, you know, like a, a lack of funds. Um, so is there a particular reason why we're taking action now? Is it so that it can be reflected in the um, first interim budget? This was that the request of the board was to bring anything actionable to this October meeting. So this is I, I this is put on this agenda at the request of the board. And would that you know would that be reflected in first interim? Yes, it would. Um, I have another question, just in general, related to um, you know. So this is the document we received last month regarding proposed um, reductions by fiscal year, and I'm wondering. How close are we? What is the target that we need to hit? Because I'm hearing different numbers sometimes. Sometimes I've heard that it's 2.5 million that must be cut. What we saw last month reflected um, approximately 1.7 million. Um, yes. I know. So it would be helpful to have kind of like a running tally so that we know how how close we are. Sure. And, and that's going to happen um, as the the first and second interim come in and then the end of the year, obviously that's when we really truly know what we've spent. But um, so 2.5 million is what I was told by the county we need to cut. 1.7 is what I brought forth to the board because I, um, you know, I projected the cuts that really basically based on what the budget committee said initially and the report that the board voted on um, back when the budget committee brought a, a, a report forth and the board voted on it. Um, I basically took that and and just kind of worked through that document because it was work that had already been um, recommended and board approved. Um, as far as, you know, where we are, we always have to look at where we are in, in the process. Um, you know, and in my opinion, it's wise to cut what you can and then look at the next interim, whatever interim's coming next and take a look at where the dust is settling and then look at our budget projections. It's an ongoing, it, it's a weekly process. It's almost daily um, in some situations. So we are monitoring. Right. I think when we're having to make these decisions, though, it, it it's so helpful to um, have an understanding of where we are currently because the 2.5 million i heard kind of like in a public comment and i don't know i mean i would like to see it kind of backed up with 
data um, because I know we are making a number of cuts where we have other cuts on the agenda for tonight. Um, so even though we heard a person in a, in a position of power tell us that that was the amount, it would be so helpful to have kind of the receipts to show um, uh, you know, which cuts have already been made and what remains. Um, because although we're hearing in some cases that we need to cut 2.5 million, when we look at our unaudited um, financial reports, last year we showed um, a nearly $4 million um, increase in our um, reserves. We were able, you know, we are, um, we had that large of a difference between we had 27 million in revenue and we, we had 23 million in expenditure. So that was a lot more promising a picture than when we're hearing that we also have to cut the 2.5 million. So at, at what point can we um, receive updated information about our status and our the need to cut? When would be an opportunity to receive okay. that information? Um, uh, CBO Leslie here. So yes, to your question, um, the. The more that we can get action on right now is more that we can include in our first interim projections. So I think if you recall um, previously um, at original budget, um, it was noted that they didn't want any reductions included um, in current year. They only want us to project them in um, 24, 25, and 25, 26 because we hadn't really taken any action towards it or made any move at that point. So the sooner that we can actually include that in our first interim is really going to help our fiscal picture on the out years because it shows that we're netting those savings. So that's going to be a big help as as we go forward. You're absolutely correct. I've heard that um, also and have been part of the uh, 2.5 million conversation. Um, it is my understanding that that was um, garnered from the fiscal expert um, information that was given to the County Office of Education that they had brought in with a letter of going concern. Um, and it's best to remember, too, that they're also looking further out. So while our three-year projection might show, I think at last run, it was like $92,000 instead of like $41,000 at, at year three ending, um, they look again at, are we continuing to deficit spend? What does it look like for the next couple of years? And so really trying to get that proactive. Um, as far as what the totals had come that uh, Superintendent Lucci Garcia um, had brought forth at the last board meeting, uh, that was really just kind of a maximum of what, um, you know, ideas had been brought together. So it was still very distressing that we weren't even reaching to the 2 million mark um, and that many of those ideas really do have to be negotiated. Um, but it was really just kind of the best faith effort as, as to what we could put onto the table and then continue to review and continue to cut as time goes on. So I, that's probably my best explanation. I don't know if I captured that appropriately for you. So. Yeah. So are you saying that we have to wait until we receive, until we're reviewing the first interim budget in December to know where we stand with um, our, how much we, how much more we need to cut? Um, if, if these go through, then I can update budgets um, based on those. Um, those would be ones that the county would then accept. But yes, at first interim, that would be now that we've closed out unaudited actuals, um, those balances, I think, were brought forth um, when we talked about the unaudited actuals and what that picture looked like. Uh, that will give us a more updated multi-year projection um, as to how deep our deficit spending goes in years two. Oh, so the $4 million in, um, that was added to the reserve from last year is has not been reflected in the projections of how much needs to be cut. Um, I think the last set that you saw were um, at the time um, our best estimated um, actuals balance, um, but we have not processed. We had not even flipped over. We just now today were able to close the books for 22, 23, and then roll those balances forward. So this is this is our freshest, our most fresh look. Actually, just happened this afternoon. So we're still in process of doing that, and then our cutoff for first interim happens on October 31st, and that's when we'll start the work of putting. Um, the most the new multi year projections together. Okay, it would just be so helpful to have a running total of what we've cut, how much we actually need to cut, and what remains. Because I don't feel like we have um, an up to date idea of of the magnitude. And I was really surprised by how much additional um, um, revenue we had last year. 
And I mean, we did net, uh, like I said, when we had the discussion about the unaudited actuals and, and brought forth that there was some additional, um, I didn't come up with $4 million additional, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 1 million, depending on that. But, um, you hold know, on, we, hold on. well, <laughs> I don't have the reports in front of me anyway. So um, all of my notes that I'd had on it, but as we looked at the unfortunate pieces, it's not going to be an exact running total. Like we've discussed many times everything is always going to change. If you ask me today what the budget is and what our imbalance is, and then you ask me tomorrow with expenses, it's going to look different. It's going to be a few dollars off. So I think the key is just making sure that we're, you know, moving towards that, you know, $1.8, $2 million mark as much as we can. And then as we're able to cut, as we're updating budgets and really seeing, you know, what we're expending as we go forth. And that's why we have those interim. Um, so we can really see where we're actually spending as compared to what we budgeted and what we can adjust down, that's really going to start to show us where we're netting. Okay. And who knows, maybe our ADA will be up and then, you know, our funding for next year will be even better. Do we have P1 data yet? I, that, that would have happened in the last week or two. Um, P1 has not been due yet. Um, the census day did happen. Um, so we have our uncertified original data. So school sites are still in process of verifying that. And we're still in process of internally auditing our unduplicated counts. Do you have a general sense of whether we have declined in since last year? Um, I do have a general sense. Um, I, we're we have increased, but by like seven students possibly. Um, it's better than declining. Better than declining. Um, ADA is really how we get paid, though. So um, it looks higher right now, but we're still very early in the school year. So we haven't. I mean, we're just edging on cold and flu season, as everyone's been seeing, and COVID season now, I guess, um, that's coming through. So I don't know how that's really going to net out. So we've been estimating at approximately, you know, between 91 and 92 percent of attendance. Um, I'm kind of hoping that as we get closer to P2, I can estimate that up to 93. Um, it does look like we have had an increase in our duplicated count. So that that helps as well. But it will uh, be more of an impact on our supplemental concentration, which really functions more like a restricted fund at this point okay thank you for um yeah i just i wish we had more solid numbers to work work with when we're making these decisions yeah it's always unfortunately it, it is always unfortunately a moving target but as long as we're making the strides and then as we submit those reports to the county as they see that um attempt and see those numbers go up i think they're going to feel a lot more comfortable and are there any additional clarifying questions? Uh, Trustee Ross, I have um, two clarifying questions. And one is in um, in relation to a comment that we had received. And if possible, I just want to read these two because it'll make my question a lot easier to understand. Um, it says, um, you know, by taking this position away, um, specifically our human resource and payroll manager as the only other confidential employees would have to take on the burden of board meetings, minutes, agendas, and board policy upkeep. Spreading the work out amongst other employees could lead to grievances with the union as these are job responsibilities of a confidential employee, not a classified employee. So my question, clarifying question is, do we have those bases covered so that we're not wearing our employees thin and that our confidential employees are doing what they need to do and our classified employees are doing what they need to do. We will not work people outside of their job description or their class. If, if I could add to that just really briefly, CBO Leslie again, um, board work is actually not considered confidential work. So the definition of what makes a confidential employee is someone who has um, intimate and hands-on um, workings um, and is considered to be an integral piece of negotiations practices. So someone who would actually run particular reports or numbers or would have um, a particular hand on working with negotiations is what is what education code in the state considers to be a confidential employee. Thank you for clarification. And my second question would be, um, we're really innovative at using funds for things. Is there any other way? I know we can't use one-time fees on staff or when, excuse me, you got me. Um, is there any other way to pull this out of any other fund to keep this assistant? Um, is there any other funding where we can get this this employee paid? Not to my knowledge. When when you when you look at restricted funding, there's there's so many rules you have to follow. So you know, I 
I'd like to say that I'm really good at making puzzle pieces work, right? And I'm really, I, I'm skilled at taking money that maybe is only one time that we can't use on staffing and using it um, to um, to support and enhance um, our sites and the learning happening in our sites. Um, but there are some things I just can't do. And I have to stay within the parameters of each uh, bucket of money. And every bucket of money that is restricted or one time has a lot of parameters. Um, some come with the plan that I've already given the board that we're on track for the plan that the board has approved. And I can't go outside of that without bringing it back. And um, some come with other parameters of this has to be used on particular staff or no staff at all. So when you really look at all the buckets of money that you know, we, that we have, which there are many buckets of money that can't do certain things. Um, and so we have looked at all of our sources. When the board asked me to bring proposed cuts, I brought those last month for discussion. Um, I, those weren't just brought, you know, just me picking the easiest thing to cut. Those were brought to you with a lot of thought and reading back into the rules, consulting with CDE, double checking the things, looking at what the budget committee said, looking at, looking at what the board had adopted and, and you know, had stated that they wanted going forward. So there was a lot of, of um, work put into each of the uh, proposals on that sheet that I gave the board and the public at the last board meeting. And then just bringing forward what the board would have to approve in October. This is this is where we are. That was all. And I, I this is President Holt. <clears throat> and I understand that this this isn't a decision made lightly. It's not a recommendation made lightly. Uh, and it certainly doesn't reflect on any individual who's currently filling that position. Um, so as a board, we ask you to make tough decisions and make hard cuts. Um, and it, you know, I regret that AUTA is not here at this point to see that we are making these cuts and we're starting with the district staff and district office. Um, so um, with that, uh, I move that we approve item 8D approval of resolution 23-24-04. Vice President Witch, I will second that. I see it's a resolution, and so I will offset the, um, is the there room for discussion? Oh, oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, for, for debate. Uh, Trustee Ross, I think my biggest concern at this point in time is that we have a lot to do. I understand we need to make cuts. I 100% I get it. Um, I don't want to leave our, our interim superintendent to do some of this stuff that has to be done with her plate so full. Um, I don't know if we can go back and recommend, even if it was part-time, but I see the value in having an assistant for our superintendent. Um, I really see the benefit of that. And I don't want to put her in, and I don't want to speak for her either. I, she's very capable of handling a lot. She's a very strong woman. So I don't want to misconstrue this. I just feel like with everything we're going through in the district, that her out of everybody losing an assistant may, may or may not be harmful to her health. This is President Holt. I, I certainly hear that too. Um, but I also, I'm, we've asked her to make these recommendations and the this is one of the recommendations that the interim superintendent made and so i also trust her to do the job that we've asked her to do um and that she's going to make decisions that she's capable of carrying out this is clerk bricklayer to clarify the position remains for this school year i mean i know that's not that that goes that will go by quickly but um so there is some work time hopefully if we're able to um retain the individual gotcha doesn't fix that for long this but... is present hold again too and i think this was part of why we asked that it get put on the agenda as soon as possible to have any of these potential cuts or, or layoffs or, or uh, cuts to positions so that way employees who are currently in those positions have the most time available um to, to look and prepare for next year 
um, instead of springing this on people in March and having a last minute HR scramble um, and last minute, you know, job searches for anybody. <clears throat> Is there any additional debate? Clerk Brickler, would you please conduct the roll? Sure. Roll um, Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Grigsby. Aye. Trustee Ross. Nay. And President Holt. Aye. The resolution carries. Moving to item 8E. Approval of Resolution 23-24-05, Elimination of Vacant Certified and Administrative Positions. So again, from the Board of Trustees meeting, um, September 13th, um, any actionable fiscal reduction proposals were to be brought forward in the October board meeting. So um, as a result of that request, this is the um, resolution that contains the elimination of vacant certificated and administrative positions. Um, and this would be effective for the 23-24 school year. Administration recommends approval of the resolution of 23-24-05, elimination of vacant certificated and administrative positions. Clerk Brickler, may I ask a clarifying question? Are any of these um, negotiable? I'm just referencing back to the spreadsheet we received last month. It seemed like most of them were not. So is this referencing like one, two, three? Are these just the, the these positions are vacant and they're not required. Okay, because there was one position it looked like um remove vacancy from 2324 budget program specialist. Is that that's separate from that's separate. Okay, okay yeah. thank you for yes. clarifying. And and if you um consider funding as well. So, you know, um the program specialist was funded out of general fund. And so um, this pulls that position out of that fund. Are there any additional clarifying questions? All right, this is President Holt. I move that we approve item 8E, approval of resolution 23-24-05. This is Trustee Griggs, I second that. Um, trust, uh, Clerk Brickler, I'll conduct the roll call vote. And so it starts with me. Um, I, um, Trustee Grigsby. Aye. Trustee Ross. Aye. President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. And the motion carries. And moving to item eight. Uh, and do we have a uh, public comment on that one this evening? Yes. I am a student of a seventh grader at E.V. Kane. I choose to come to your district because you have a comprehensive middle school and is the only one in our area. Um, we should live in Christian Valley, so should be going to Weimar and Sierra Hills. So um, the fact that this is on the docket again for the K-8 when it won't even make even a quarter of a difference is very frustrating as someone who's choosing to come here. Um, if we're looking at a K-8, why are we looking at three then? When E.V. Kane can hold our entire student body, why don't we go to one school, which would make probably the difference that we have? Not that that's what I would want. Or why don't we go and look at that becoming the elementary school that's a TK through six and moving our middle school and being able to be competitive by still having a middle school to one of the other campuses? which I know would mean retrofits have to happen, but these are ideas that should be explored and haven't been explored. And to see that the attachment of the fiscal plan is a year and a half old, which means that data is almost two years old, is ridiculous, in my opinion. There should be better figures for you guys to be looking at. Going off topic, the fact that you said this is not personal when I send the most personal thing in my life to your district is hurtful. The fact that you guys didn't know about the Renaissance Fair means you're not even looking at your own calendar on your district site that's been on there for months. It's been Facebook posted asking for volunteers. 
And that is hurtful that then you guys aren't even going to be there to support something that's important to this community and to these seventh graders. It's very, very frustrating. Thank you for your time. Um, in 2022, the Board of Trustees voted to adopt a fiscal recovery plan that included a grade, a grade, a grade reconfiguration at E.V. Kane Middle School and district wide, amongst other recommendations for budget reductions in fiscal years 2023, 2022 to 2023, and 2023 to 2024, to prevent fiscal insolvency. During the implementation of that adopted plan, grade reconfiguration was not acted upon due to the inability to prepare appropriately as the final board decisions had been delayed. The Board of Trustees noted during that time that grade reconfiguration would need to be reevaluated in the future. For the Board of Trustees request at the September 13th board meeting, any actionable fiscal reduction proposals were to be brought forth for board action at the October board meeting. As such, this recommendation for a district-wide grade reconfiguration is being brought for approval. Administration recommends approval uh, to implement a district-wide TK-8 program as best determined by the superintendent. Are there any clarifying questions? Oh, absolutely. This is Kirk Brickler. <laughs> um, um, well, let me try to put this into the form of a clarifying question. With the gravity of this decision, I would hope to see some sort of a plan that is focused on what um, is best for students to really understand how um, students would be impacted. I understand that the motivation is that we are being told we need to cut more. And again, I don't have the answers about how much more we need to cut. And I don't know how imperative it is that we make this decision at this time. But what I would like to see is um, a really thoughtful plan about how this would work, how families' concerns would be resolved, how, what sort of um, programs, a really like focus on what the experience is for our students and what they would have access to in terms of educational opportunities and extracurricular op opportunities. Um, I, I really need to see a plan to understand how this would work and what the impacts would be. Um, so, I mean, from this these documents, it wasn't even entirely clear to me that this meant TK-8 at our three existing sites. There's just been so much speculation in the community because there's so little that is said here about um, how this would be implemented. So could you try to explain what, your thinking is around how this might be implemented? So we currently have TK-5 at two sites and that TK-5 program would, um, would remain the program that we utilize the program model that we utilize at all three sites if we were to go TK-8. We have six, eight at one site and we would utilize and um, mimic that model to the best of our ability depending on enrollment um, student numbers at each of our sites. So what that means is students will have access to all the core subjects and electives. Um, we could, uh, so sports has been brought up a couple of times um, where Principal Mayberry did say that um, Faisal will um, not allow all of our schools to compete um, in the league. We know that we can partner with, um, potentially partner with ARD or just offer our own club sports. Um, as far as band, I heard something about band. I'm sorry, um, could you go back have... to, I didn't, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I didn't, couldn't follow what you were saying about Faisal, for example. I thought one, I don't know if you recall be last year, but grandfathered uh, in. that's what we had heard last year. So of course, you know, when, um, when we reach back out to them, has anything changed? To my knowledge, no. Would Evie Kane still be allowed to, um, as a TK-8, participate? That's possible, but would that be something that the district would find to be equitable, right? And so um, in terms of how sports are played, there are, there are many ways to offer sports to all of our students. 
Um, we can offer them through club club sports or partnering with agencies. Um, we have funds available for after school, such as ELOP and other funds um, to enrich uh, club, clubs and sports. And um, the supplemental concentration uh, funding that we have based on student um, request, the students want more sports at all their sites. And so we have some supplemental concentration set aside for that as well. Um, in terms of band, we have um, Prop 28, we have the art music uh, block grant to be able to hire um, a band director as needed to run band at all three sites. Um, if we need an, an, an additional band director, because we currently have a band director, so then we could potentially hire an, an additional band director or band staff. Um, some of the other uh, questions that have come up have, were um, if kids will have access to art and that type of thing. So we currently have VAPA at our TK5 sites. And at our middle school, the goal was to have the, cor the courses um, that align up to that VAPA um, uh, class for kids so that they can transition into middle school into arts and um, drama or you know, theater arts, depending on, on what the elective is called um, and that type of thing. So um, the variety of um, electives at each site depends on the number of students that are attending and the number of staff we have to serve. But I've seen um, six, eight models where kids continue to switch classes and kids continue to receive electives. Um, we have opportunities to use our supplement, supplemental concentration dollars to uh, fund world languages or other um, access to um, like a, a broad course of study for our students. Um, each site would have access to all of the things that kids currently have access to. It's just going to look a little bit different as for the layout and that type of thing. Would it be possible to have, um, I would like to delay the decision until we can see a plan and know, have more specific information about what it would look like. That's a board decision, so. And this is President Holt. Um, one of the previous discussion items we had, especially around the EV Kane decision, or excuse me, Alta Vista, was playgrounds at EV Kane. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to why can we afford it now or where we put it? What's different if we were to make EV Kane a TK to rate um, instead of just having a charter school in one part of it and the middle school in the other? So when the charter school was um, proposed to um, be added to the EV Kane site. It was going to be added up in, in the area that we call the sixth grade village, which is where the portables and such are. Um, we were unable to put a playground in, in that area due to um, there being a fire lane and ADA restrictions. And it was going to cost a lot of money to put that playground in. And the board determined that that wasn't an expense that we could incur at the time. Um, and then all the other things um, that, that happened. Um, and so when you look at the campus now, you can um, find, well, when I and Heather looked at the campus now, we were able to locate spaces where playground equipment can go for the, the different levels of age group of student. Um, and then, and so um, Heather can probably speak to some of that as well um, as facilities, but we did identify some, some locations that we could put TK, TKK equipment, and then also um, the, the elementary equipment, the sixth to eighth grade all um, at EVK already has, you know, that the area where they can do some exercise and that type of thing. We can add those types of um, structures as needed to our elementary sites to make it equitable across the district. Is there anything, Heather, that you um, need to add? Um, no, I Actually, think. Excuse me, if I could before that. Yeah, sure. Please stop interrupting. Thank you. Um, I think you were absolutely on track with that. So we were looking at um, both location um, for some access up in the sixth grade village area or what they used to call the sixth grade village area. Um, and it was difficult to find a good placement for that. Uh, the secondary issue was because the playground was going to be specified for that individual school that would be residing on that campus to place it lower um, was going to cause an access issue um, as well. It would have taken quite a bit of mitigation. Now, if we look at the school site as offering the lower grades that would be accessing that playground in the lower area, 
um, it takes away a majority of those concerns that the Division of State Architect had. So um, it ends up becoming a much more feasible um, proposition. And um, it, just to remind again, we were looking at um, as a district, we were going to have to front money, district money for an individual LEA charter school that at the time had approximately 100 students. So it was also, um, you know, a, a discussion of available funds and was that the most um, uh, prudent way to utilize the district funds for that particular application. Um, okay. oh, go, go, please. Uh, uh, Trustee Ross, um, my, I have two questions. Um, one, I would really love to see what the costs are going to be through all our schools as compared to how much we will save. Um, I know we will have an initial fee, a, a big one. And is that ultimately going to put us in debt just to get us out of debt? Because it's going to cost a lot to to do all these things, to make everything complicit and, and everything right. Um, how long is it going to take us to actually get out of the red if we're spending money to get out of the red? That's my first so, question. Um, we are cutting um, from the general fund. That That is our goal here because that's what's going to put us back into fiscal health. When you talk about um, facilities, there are different facility funds that we will utilize just like we did for um, the move this up this year that we're currently in. Um, Heather can speak a little bit more about those buckets of money, but we do have restricted money that we can use to do some of this work. And of course, there's going to be, you know, the initial, you know, cost, just like there was to move the schools and such. But we're looking at the multi-year projection because that's really, you know, we're, we're looking at the now, right? But we're also looking down the line and you've seen how the numbers change. If you're saving a little bit here, you know, it, it becomes bigger and bigger and more that you're saving down the line. And again, Heather can explain that in more um, business-like terms than I am. I'm just generally speaking, but you, you are correct. We will spend some money to save money. And, and CBO Leslie, that, that's absolutely correct. So, and as we talk about it, the key things that we've discussed before is netting um, or saving ongoing funds. So as we look at general fund expenditures, if we do have some one-time expenditures, those are one-time expenditures that as we go forth, will still save us money as we go on. So it's not like we do expend, let's just say, I'm just totally pulling a number like $20,000. Let's just say we have $20,000 we have to spend um, that may come out of this fiscal year or next fiscal year but it's going to be one time, whereas we'll continue to see the ongoing savings year after year. And and I and I just want to add as well that this we've had these conversations ongoing for quite a while. So n nothing that we're really bringing you here is brand new or, you know, being revealed here today. This is you know, the um, we've talked about the programs and and the sports and and the playgrounds and that type of thing in the past. I just, I'm just bringing that forward again, because this is a, you know, something that the board has asked me to do to make sure that we are on track to fiscal health. Right. So, so again, you know, this is the board's decision, what the board decides we will implement. Um, but in looking at um, fiscal reductions, we have identified that we believe we'll save at least for um, 409, I, I believe is a figure. I don't have it right here in front of me. Um, and that that is just in um, in staffing alone. Going down the line, depending on you know what what the programs are we're implementing, if we if we have more ADA or more students enrolling because of the K8 um, status, you know that could change as well. Um, Trustee Ross. So to add to that question, because you're saying it'll be cut in staffing possibly is where the majority of that money is. However, we're still going to need three science teachers. We're still going to yes. need three math teachers. We're still going to need the same amount of staff and education. We're still going to need the counselors. So I'm, I'm trying to understand how we're actually saving money. If we're replicating what's at EV Kane on three campuses, how is that saving money? I guess I just wish I could see the plan. Of so I, I can't say that we will need the same 
number of everything until we we see the numbers, the enrollment, right? I mean, that I, I, I'm never going to sit here and say for sure, we're going to need the exact same amount of staff that we have right now. But when we're going through and we're identifying the staff needed to staff these three schools, these are the numbers that we came up with. Now, um, I think you saw in the proposal that I put on last board meeting, um, you know, two of those staff would be potentially reduced, but then two of those could be paid for out of supplemental concentration by means of how we are, um, when you have a six eight at each site, then you have um, the need to provide certain programs at each site, right? And so if you look at how we have, let's just use Spanish as an example, at one site paid for um, as an after school club with specific funds, um, if we have Spanish at all three sites and we have an itinerant teacher, could I use a different bucket of money to pay for that teacher and offer um, access to a broad course of study that we're not able to offer right now. So those are also things I'm looking at. And when I look at restricted funding and I'm looking at the art music block grant and prop 28, and I'm, and, and, and I'm wondering, we, you know, we have a band teacher. I can't hire another band teacher for one school right now because that's supplanting, right? But could we um, do something more with music or band or something with the arts at, at the three sites, because now we have a need at three sites and that makes more sense. The, these are things that I'm working through in my mind about what would the programs look like, right? And and I know that there is a desire to see every, and I, everything charted out and exactly what, you know, what we would, um, what we would do, but that's really hard to do um, when you are proposing uh, something that hasn't been decided on. And I know that that sounds counterintuitive, but it's a lot of work to put together master schedules for three different sites so that I can show you black and white, this is exactly what it would look like based on projected enrollment and that type of thing. But what I can tell you is, is that currently our students have access to core subjects and electives and clubs and after school programs at all of our sites. And there was absolutely the, the desire to continue that. And if we can better that, because we have now, you know, um, additional means potentially um, based on providing something that we couldn't provide before using restricted funding. Trustee Ross, I'm just gonna say, it's really hard to focus on the what when we don't know what the what is. So until we can see a sure. vision for what's going to be outlaid, I don't know how you're going to need different staffing if we still have the same amount of students. We still have to cover the same amount of students. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around how that's going to ultimately change in $400,000 when we hopefully have more and not less students to cover. Right. So I'm, I'm trying, I'm just trying to understand it. And without that, what it's really hard to understand. And if we have more students come, then, then we can pay for the more teachers because we'll have more funding with the students. And, you know, from my understanding and, and what I've read back in time over the history of this conversation when it started, yes, about a year and a half, two years ago, um, while there, it, there are people that want to keep the conference at middle school, there are also people saying that they're not here because we don't have one. And so, you know, where will we land? Will, will we lose people and gain others? Will we gain more? Will we gain less? I, I don't know. I can't um, tell you that for sure. Because just like this year, um, when we started the year, we had 580 students enrolled at one of our elementary schools. And now we have, and only 540 something showed up. And I, I don't know our exact numbers right now, because again, we're right in the middle of analyzing all that data, um, but 580 didn't show up. And so, and so when you're talking about the, the people to the program, you know, we are constantly analyzing the student count, the need and what we want to do for programs. And I'm going to tell you, I am the I am the former program person, and I say former because now I do more than programs, not because I don't still do programs, but I I do way less work in the program area now because I'm covering much more territory, and as the the program person, I want the chart paper in the room. I want all the big ideas. I want to do all the planning, but that's not how this 
this doesn't work that way. We have to use, you know, we have to project. And so projecting can make things hard and it can make it feel like we're not sure that we're doing the right thing. But this is, you know, I'm bringing to you today something that you asked me to, to recommend. This is something that I took that was recommended in the past that I'm bringing forward to you. And then you all can, can make the decision. And so whatever you decide again, um, I will move forward with the decision. I appreciate that. Uh, Trustee Ross, one more time. I just, um, cause what I'm hearing you say is that it's uncertain what we're going to need for this program. It's uncertain because we don't know how many students we could get more, we could get less. So how are we sure that we're going to even save 409 thousands if we're just making estimations? And we're now, but that, that's my point district. is that, but, but we're never sure. And until, you know, we, we follow, we track the budget through the interims to the final budget. We're always projecting. That's, that's what we do. Like for instance, we projected um, supplemental concentration funding would be spent this year on a vice principal. And I know everybody wants a vice principal. I can't hire a vice principal. I I've just sort of begged people to come here. And so there's, there's approximately a hundred thousand dollars sitting right there that we haven't spent. So when you get the first interim, you're going to see a lot of money there because we budgeted for it and we can't hire it. That some of that is just out of our control. So we project and we plan and we dream and we want to do all the things that we can do. But in the end, the people have to show up to work. The kids have to show up to come to school. We, we, all we can do is our very best to bring the best programs, the best quality education to our students. And that's, that's what I'm bringing you today. And if, if this is CBO Leslie, if I could interject, um, the as we look at these approximate costs or approximate savings in staff, um, again, I want you to keep in mind that these are conservative. So right now, if we look at how many middle school students we had and split them out pos possibly equitably throughout three sites, um, looking at um, the sixth grade as being a more of a um, you know, in, in classroom, little minor changes, but with keeping um, with California state code of having single subject credentials and how that looks in other six or eight or um, in, in TK eight, but for six or eight um, classes, that's the minimum amount of staff that we possibly um, would be able to reduce by going to this model. So just by projecting those out of these certain kids and putting them into a program approximately and how other TK-8 surrounding us, um, change classes, we already know that because the scheduling is so different with the middle school and how they master schedule it out for each period, um, we have classrooms that aren't full at every time. So a lot of those programs are actually even going to be hard to run next year because we just won't have the students for it, um, including some of the art classes, which are short on students right now. We were concerned that we would even have um, a period that had enough students to even run a class um, or any students at all. So that would be the minimum amount of staff that we would be able to reduce should we go TK-8 at three sites. Now, if we get there and we find as we start plugging those students in, as we start really looking at credentials, we may be able to reduce more. There might be more depending on programs that are available or what um, our credential teachers at those sites can teach as electives and what they're credentialed for, that may change of what we can fund through the restrictive funds. And I think that's what she's really trying to mimic there. So other outlying factors um, could be savings. Um, this is just really the bare minimum that we could look at saving um, should we go through a TKA model. This is President Holt. Uh, looking at the document that was attached, uh, you know, dated March 16th, 22, um, when you're looking at the middle school operational costs and the, the difference then between the middle and elementary school, when you were putting those together, were you considering the offset, you know, when we've got like uh, office staffing, um, were you looking at still having, the, you know, accounting for the students being at the other sites? Is that considered in that math? Um, that was really just a very basic um, calculation. So we could just see what the difference is. What's the basic difference? Um, once you start getting into how many additional staff would need to be at certain sites, um, the staffing ratios that are board adopted do depend often on whether or not it's a middle school or it's an elementary. And in some cases we do have um, TK-8 um, sites. So I didn't take those into consideration at this time, just um, assuming that the populations would be approximately the same in a lot of other areas. Um, we also have such things as counselors um, that Trustee Ross had brought up um, that are funded through um, restricted funding at this time 
so we would anticipate that we would still want to see some presence of counselors at all the sites at that point. So then that just becomes itinerant staff paid for out of restricted funding. Um, so there may be some adjustments adjustments that happen, but um, I feel that they'd probably be fairly minor comparatively. So just depending on what the population comes out to, then that's where it's really going to come into those staffing ratios. Thank you. Um, this is Clerk Brickler. I, I still am having trouble understanding the difference in how we save money by operating TK8 versus middle school. I know you were touching on this now. Um, we have the older calculations, but I, you last month you indicated that there would be um, two uh, certificated FTE that could be reduced and a, a 0.5 classified staff and then the other two FTE that could be shifted to supplemental and concentration. So can you just, I'm, I'm still having trouble understanding same number of students, we're offering comparable courses and and experiences to these kids, but how is it that we can uh, operate with fewer staff? Because we're overstaffed at the middle school currently. I don't know that the middle school staff would agree with that statement. Would, but... <laughs> but no, I mean, honestly, it's, and again, that's when you're working at a master schedule, you're filling that teacher for every period. We don't have 28 to 32 students in every single one of those classrooms. When we're looking at spreading it out, we have to start looking at how many students to be placed into each classroom. Then those classroom units move to science, to math, May to whatever. Try? So it becomes a little bit different. So you're saying, um, not to pick on an art teacher, but let's say we have an art teacher and they do not um, have full classes for all of their periods. So you're saying that that's, um, they could be better utilized if they were itinerant and they were driving to three sites in order to provide that programming. Absolutely. And then also they could be paid for out of restricted funding. So you're still paying the art teacher. But not other general still, funds. So it's really more about, so what you, you've differentiated, in some cases, we're talking about shifting to a restricted funding source. That's two FTE, but there's still 2.5 FTE that you've indicated Um could just be cut because there's essentially, I think you're essentially implying that the TK8 model is more efficient and I'm trying to understand why. So when when you take the numbers of students and you um, and you apply the staffing ratio, um, this is what we came up with. This, you know, when we have the students to match the, the FTE minus the two and with the other two in the supplemental concentration or some other restricted funding source. That's what we did. So if we lose more students, that will change. If we gain more students, that will change. But with more students comes more funding. Yeah. I don't know that we can bank on more students. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I've heard I, from yeah. the community um, and I, I've heard both sides. There are folks who desperately want a TK-8. Mm -hmm. There are folks who desperately want to maintain the comprehensive middle school model. And we have a real split in our community, which makes this really hard. Um, but um, I think one of the challenges I think we face is that the implementation of this and, and how, um, how this works and, um, the distribution of students across these three campuses is really challenging because we may be asking students who just moved schools this year to once again, move schools next year because they've been redistricted because they live closer to one of the schools than another. Um, there, there's just a, a potential for so much chaos, I think, for our families that I don't know that results in retention having to shift. Imagine if you, I mean, I know families that have, um, let's say they have a current, I'm, I'm going to pick on you, a seventh grade student. Um, and then that st student would be asked to return to their kind of like home school where they attended elementary, for example. Um, so I, I can address that. Um, if you recall last year, some part of last year, the conversation came up about redrawing boundaries. So we couldn't do it last year because you know, it, we were well into the, um, it's, it's too late to do the deep planning once the decisions were made. Okay. So, um, so the board did discuss, um, drawing new attendance boundaries, which Heather had already looked into doing. Um, but then we tabled it because that we were advancing too far into the end of the year. 
Um, and then, you know, as far as creating chaos, I, I understand that chaos would be a word that some use. I, I would not use that word because chaos implies there's no planning or no, um, desire for order. And that's not at all how we operate. We put a lot of planning and a lot of time into, um, making sure that things went as smoothly as possible. We also said that there would be bumps and that there would be some issues we have to work out because we all know that that's the case. We are in the business of um, serving um, students and we have a large staff. And whenever you work in the business of um, humans, right? There are always a lot of different ways that things um, will need to be adjusted. But we also in education claim to be very flexible and very understanding because at the end of the day, we want to make a difference for our students. So I, so I, I, I just want to remind the board that this was, this was something that was going to come back anyway. And that's, and if you read the, the wording here in the rationale, I, I did make sure to to bring that back to the board because this was language you used last year. So, so again, I just want to make it very clear. I'm not bringing something brand new that I just designed and, you know, in my living room over the summer, that's not what I'm doing. I'm bringing, I'm bringing back something that has been discussed and we've looked at different possibilities for doing things. You know, would we have enough students to run a full, you know, um, sixth grade, departmentalized class or would we do cohorts you know what you know will we have so many students that that we can do departmentalized and have even more electives and 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 more after school programs i mean in, we're we're going to have to fill that out but i also don't want to skip something that that isn't being, ta being talked about at all here when it comes to planning and implementation i'm not going to draw the plan and the and and out all the implementation pieces by myself to bring here. And I know I said that previously, but I, I'm gonna explain why. The people that would be involved in this planning are the principals and their staff at their sites. Families would be involved. This is all um, work that would be done, um, you know, and discussed in LCAP meetings and ELAC meetings, DLAC meetings, other community meetings. I mean, we, we don't, I, I can't possibly sit here and create the flawless implementation plan that feels like we should be able to create because I need the input of the community. And, and I know that the word is that I'm not listening to the community, but I'm going to draw out some instances where I have listened to the community. And again, going back to the English learner TOSA position, because that's the freshest position that we have brought here. It's funded through supplemental concentration dollars that absolutely um, parents of our ELAC and DLAC communities have asked for support for English learners. Um, we have brought other things such as we've added some money for clubs and sports that students themselves ask for in our student voices sessions. So the implementation, the planning of this needs more people than just me telling you this is the best thing for, this is how we're going to do it because it's the best for our district. I, I need the input and the wisdom of our staff and our families and our students, our, our students, especially at the sites to do this well. So this is President Hall. I just want to clarify too. I, I don't think anybody uh, is is suggesting that this is just your personal opinion in terms of Thank you. it's not a personal, uh, nobody, nobody on the, the board here is trying to lob it and lob it uh, Thank you. back against you. So um, I think we all do remember the conversations that went went late and several conversations we had about EDK and um, what would happen with EDK. Thank you. Um, are there additional clarifying questions? I yeah. have. Oh, sorry. I have just one more, just because you did bring up the um, the input of the community, which I really appreciate. Have we and you know how much we love surveys. Have we done a survey to see who do a K through eight over middle school and how that would go? Have we asked our parents about this yet? That was done previously, um, I believe, by the former superintendent. Um, and, um, you know, I don't have the results handy, but I believe that surveys and town halls and um, a variety of different meetings and input sessions um, were given. And I believe that the board was presented with that information at the time that we were having all the discussions. You do remember that survey? This is Kirk Brickler, and I do remember the survey, and I was trying to find it the other day, and I think there seemed to be, I think the surveys are difficult because it's not like there is um, a representative sample of our families that participate in those. I think that there were, I found that there were some limitations to what we could 
um, interpret from that data? Right. I don't think we really know. I We are reliant on public comment and we can't necessarily say like, well, 10 people said they wanted a comprehensive middle school and, you know, 11 said they wanted TK-8. So right. it's, I, I don't have a good idea of, of um, where our families stand. But um, um, I do think there's some middle ground between asking for a master plan and what the schedule would look like um, under the scenario and what we were presented with tonight. So I, I, I just think that we could... I think that there's more detail that could be provided that um, doesn't have to go to that level of detail of like of giving us a class schedule. But as a trustee, when I read this um, item and the and the information that was associated, I didn't even know if that applied to three schools. We're hearing rumors about whether or not another school is going to close, and it would be really helpful to kind of dispel some of the rumors that are. Uh, there's a rumor that we are going to close an additional school, which is not something I've ever heard, but I thought it would be important to, uh, what I'm saying is this plan, this information presented tonight had so little detail that I didn't even know which schools would be involved. This is President Holt. Yeah. I, I've got to interject though. We've discussed this at the last two board meetings. Um, so we've discussed this in public forum, and I believe I put that into my comments as well after the last board meeting that it would be on tonight's agenda. So that this discussion would be. Um, so, well, somebody reached out to me today and said, I didn't even hear that in your, they, they heard the comments you made about incidents. And I don't know that, I don't know that okay. it was heard I, I or received in the way that you're okay. thinking it was. I think we certainly put on as a request um, at that board meeting. I made the request that we would have this on the agenda. Um, and I believe I put it in the comments that we sent out after our last meeting as well, that we would be discussing this and specifically came. I mean, I can pull it up. Uh, so, wait, but, but what is the, um, the, 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 the what I was I'm saying to get to, yeah. is that mm -hmm. if you're saying you didn't know what was going to be on the agenda, or you didn't understand this agenda item, it's been discussed several times um, in public session. It's been unclear whether we're talking about um, TK8 at three sites at um, how many sites we're considering, because there's also this rumor that we're closing additional schools. And so I think it would be helpful um, to have some sort of, like even a one page plan that talks about, we, we, we propose TK-8 at Auburnell, at E.V. Kane, at Skyridge Elementary. I mean, that's, that hasn't even been um, communicated. So I guess I'm, I would be getting away from questions, so I'm not going to continue down that. But you thought it was clear that this plan was intended to be implemented at our three current schools. I mean, it's correct. It's, also, it's for, 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 we, there are uh, rumors pop up every day, and I don't think we can pretend to have the foresight to address every possible rumor that could happen, because no matter what decision we make or no matter what conversations had, a different rumor will pop up. So, um, you know, I heard the rumor as well that Skyridge would be closing and uh, the person who shared with me, I, I shared back that that's completely baseless. And that was the first time that I'd heard it. So uh, I, it's not a conversation that's been had um, in the district office that I'm aware of. It certainly hasn't made it to any trustee that I'm aware of. Uh, the point I'm making is that if we can provide a bit more detail, then then the community has something to respond to, that that it would help all of us improve our understanding of what's being proposed, that sometimes when there's so little information, people are left to speculate. Um, just to add on the Board of Trustees proposed plan, it does say close EV Kane, convert to K through eight campus. So what's on here and what's on here, it doesn't match. So I think just asking for clarity on what is it we're actually proposing, because these are two different things. I okay, well, I, I, this is President Hall. I'm just going to read from the agenda item, the action item. In 2022, the Board of Trustees voted to adopt a fiscal recovery plan that inclu included grade reconfiguration at EVK and Middle School and district wide, amongst other recommendations for budget reductions in fiscal years 22, 23, and 23, 24. During the implementation of the adopted plan, grade reconfiguration was not acted upon due to the inability to prepare appropriately as final board decisions had been delayed. So, as the Board of Trustees noted at a time that great reconfiguration would need to be reevaluated in the future. So I, I just fail to see what's not clear that this states that it would be about great reconfiguration at EDK Middle School. I so think I that understand term, that maybe yeah. there's some room for different interpretations, yeah. um, but I think there are also people who interpret it to understand exactly what would be discussed tonight. 
So. I just think that the term grade reconfiguration is so open to interpretation that could it, it's just it's undefined. So, um, well, we, anyway, um, I don't want to perseverate on this point. I just I what I'm asking for is a plan because I, um, it's one thing that we have to save money, but I think what we really need to do is convince our families to stay with us and and new families to join us because we have a vision of how to educate students and um in, a, in an ideal you know setting and if we can focus on the programmatic aspects that we're in a much stronger position than if we are focused on um this is something we have to do to save money so that's what i'm asking for is a vision for sell me on the fact that this is going to be better for kids. I, I, I'm, that's the piece that's missing for me. And as CBO Leslie, and I know I'm, I'm always kind of the wet blanket on a lot of these, but unfortunately, I mean, from the business standpoint, and I know that we do talk a lot about programs and, you know, how do we sell this and, and how do we know this is good for kids? And really what we're looking at is I don't want any of us to lose sight of the fact that if we don't take drastic measures and I don't know where else you would cut, like we talked about in, in previous fiscal reductions, four hundred thousand plus dollars um, in in one swoop that would get that that we would be facing fiscal insolvency, which means, as you had heard before, that um, that would take away all the local control. So, what's good for kids um, would be the last option when we get taken over. So, it's really important that we keep fiscal solvency as the main point. Right. And back to the point of, I don't know how much we have to cut at this point because the unaudited actuals paint a slightly different picture and we won't know until December, I suppose, about where, where we stand again. And as we do talk about community and the choices in community, um, and, and I know there are people that are very, very dedicated to the comprehensive middle school um model and as we talked about those that we, we've heard about from the community that are very dedicated to a TKA type program that that leave our district um, prior to even registering in kindergarten and and go to other sites um, one key thing that I do want to point out is we're looking at the future of EV Kane whether it's um, in the current comprehensive model or as we look at district-wide TK8 um, just in this last year we had a drop of 53 students um, so that is far off of our typical um, cohort survival it's not at all what we projected. So while we've grown, we've grown a little bit more in the elementary and we've dropped 53 students just in one school year from our middle school. So we're down to 471 students, 474 if you count um, some of the independent study and special education. Um, so we're operating at well under 500 students at this point and projections continue with the uh, recent bubbles that we've had in some of those grades going out, um, continue to decline. So currently, if nothing else changes um, and we just keep the regular cohort survival as it is, we're looking at continuing to decline in our sixth through eighth grade as it sits right now. So just in the past year, 53 families or 53 students have made the choice not to attend that comprehensive model. And that's very concerning when we're looking at a budgeting perspective because I would have budgeted just for our typical cohort survival, which is what we have to go off of. And that would have been a huge dive. Um, if we were to see something like that in the next year for any reason, it, it's going to deeply impact the budget. Uh, Trustee Ross, what, and this is, I think, what we asked for when we're looking for a plan, what does a TK through eight model look like at Auburn Elementary, where there is no upper, lower, campus like at ev kane we can separate that at sky ridge we could even possibly separate that i don't see that as a possibility at auburn elementary are we just because i know that's a big concern separating kindergartners from eighth graders was our biggest concern with moving alta vista to ev kane so how do we how do we how does that look what does that look like at a school like auburn elementary i um just to just to remind the board the the biggest concern about having a k5 to k5 TK5, charter school campus on a middle school campus was that they were very separated already. Two different schools, two different LEAs sharing one campus. 
um, in a TK-8 model, you're going to see things like um, students buddying and mentoring programs. Um, you're going to see students, um, you know, working together in some capacities as teachers work together um, to ensure that students have that that um, that time with each other. So um, our TK-5 population um, can look at their 6-8 um, student population as leaders and mentors of the school and of the different grade levels. Um, as, as far as logistics goes on a school campus, um, that's determined by the principal in a typical situation. When I look at um, the maps of our school sites, I can see areas where principals can choose to, to locate six to eight grade classes. Um, we don't want our students completely separated. So we talked about that again with Alta Vista and Evie Kane because two different schools, how do you um, keep the two different schools separate when they have not been together all along through their grade school? But we're talking about, and two different staffs at that and two different parent family populations, right? But this, but we're talking about a TK-8 school is the home to all students and and the families attend the siblings are there um the the sixth to eighth grade um kids again you know there we we have leadership opportunities now for our students not every student wants to be in leadership but some students would love to mentor right i mean it, it, if, if you want to talk about having something for everyone, this is a great opportunity for some of those types of things to occur at a site where they can't currently. Um, so, so again, going back to the logistics, the principals would work with their staff on the logistics for their site. Um, absolutely with my coaching or my support or all of us in the room together, um, brainstorm, you know, with brainstorming ideas of what's best. Um, but as far as, you know, having all students on the campus, they are a student family. We would want them to be able to have opportunities to interact, um, but when appropriate and, and, and how we wish for them to interact. And so even just thinking about what PBIS would look like, you know, we have people come in and do assemblies, but, you know, in a TK-8 family school setting, you know, would we have to bring in people from out of our district to do assemblies or could our middle school kids do that for the, the younger students on campus, you know? So just thinking about those opportunities. This is Clerk Brickler. What happens if we are unable to um, attract students, younger students to Evie Kane? Because I think that was one of the challenges was whether or not families felt comfortable sending younger students. The reason I'm thinking about this is this whole model is dependent upon so Auburnell is is um very full. I think Skyridge, I think they they feel full because they're they have more students than they've had um in the, the last few years. It's hard for me to imagine. Um, I think that the, the model is dependent upon shifting some of those students to a central Auburn location so that you would have space at, at the two current elementary schools for six, seven, eight. We kind of have to have students redistribute in thirds to our three campuses in order for this, or roughly thirds for this to work. So what happens if, you know, we don't have movement, we don't have enough students that are choosing Evie Kane, for example. Um, and so, so, we're, so we're lopsided. So we don't have, you know, a, a, a distribution of students that would be workable. So when, when, when you say that parents had hesitations about bringing their, um, their younger students to the Evie King campus, that was again with that model of having two different LEAs, two different separate school families, two different staffs and all that, right? So um, that absolutely was a big concern for our families. Um, but if you're looking at embracing the school as a TK-8 school unit where again, siblings are there, cousins are there, you know, friends are there, um, families know each other. I mean, I, I know that it's hard to picture right now because the school is currently a middle school, but if it becomes a TK-8, then it, then it becomes a TK-8 and families enroll their kids and they embrace the model of TK-8, it will look different. The campus will look different. Um, you know, what there'll be, uh, TK K types of playgrounds and play structures and inviting for students of all ages because that's what we would do to ensure that students felt welcomed. I, I think that the concern that you're speaking of was um, 
more about the two separate entities at one site and bringing small kids all the way through a campus to the upper part of that campus or even getting them down to lunch and back. And I remember those conversations happening um, and that being a big concern for parents. Um, but that's not how the school would be set up. And, and, and again, the principals, you know, they're going to set their school up and their classrooms up and um, lay out the logistics of how kids access school in a way that's friendly to all students, right? Um, grade friendly um, groupings or grade level groupings or, you know, um, how that, how the schedule is could reflect so again, that time where students could interact in a positive mentoring type of way. Um, but I think there is a legitimate concern, whatever the concerns were with AltaVista set aside, that EV Kane would be almost like a startup school because you already have these established elementary schools where, where parents are sending their younger students. And so you're having to ask people to, to opt in to like, I, I would have to take my um, my kids to a third school and a third year to go to Kane. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a bigger ask of parents to relocate, to um, populate EB Kane with TK through five. Sure. And, and that very well could be, but it also could be um, something that's um, alleviated for those that live closer to the school. Right, they have to travel right now further to get to um, a school campus. So when when you're looking at at attendance boundaries, you're looking at you know students who live in the area. And so would this also be something that people are relieved by because they're closer to the school and now within walking distance, or they can go with their sibling, you know, um, to school in the morning versus having two different drop off locations. So I I can imagine that we could think of a hundred ways that people could feel and, and how this would impact families. There's no doubt it will impact families. Um, but I, you know, when, when we um, heard people's comments and their concerns and their excitement and all the things that we've heard, I've heard a little bit of everything. I've heard my, I want my kids to go to school together. I've heard, um, you know, I, I want it to be something that's um, easier for my family. And then I've heard concerns over, you know, sports programs and that type of thing. So I, I understand what you're saying and I can't alleviate everyone's concerns, nor can you. And I know, you know that, um, but I also wonder how many families would be relieved to have something closer to their, to their home. This is President Holt, shifting gears slightly, um, probably more for CBO. Would we be able to have a playground installed before school started in August? Oh, thank you, CBO Leslie. Um, if we're able to get direction from the board that this is how we're moving, then I can get plans going, and then that way it can be installed over the summer. Um, if we, again, if if it's a delayed decision, if we move a little bit more into the beginning of the year, um, it's going to be more difficult to guarantee that I would be able to have something in place. What is the permitting timeline look like, permitting and approval? How many months does that normally run? Um, if I was doing a little bit more um, of uh, something that would need a lot more Division of State Architect approval, we definitely want to be in by the 1st of December. Um, so that's an easy guarantee um, as we start getting a little bit closer. Um, sometimes we can do them over the counter um, where we make an appointment and bring in plans and Division of State Architect, take, Division of State Architect can have a look at it. Uh, during that appointment and sometimes approve if it's pretty easy um, with some of the ADA accessibility things that we were already going to be addressing. Um, I think it might take a little bit more time. So I would feel, you know, we want to break ground probably in June. So May, April, February, we would want to be in, yeah, no later than the end of January. Um, to add on to President Holt's question, with you saying that we need to make sure that, um, you know, in order to get shade structures, we have to do all of this stuff. Is, are, are we going to be ready for a playground? Like, are we going to be allowed to bring on a playground with everything we have to get approved? A playground actually runs a little bit different in approvals okay. um, than a shade structure because shade structures go overhead. So uh, they're, uh, have a little bit of a different um, code requirements than a playground structure. So playground structures are a little bit more geared to um, playground safety requirements, such as like fall radiuses and things like that. And then also accessibility. Those are the two big ones. Um, as far as the shade structure, then we can move more into the engineering 
So this won't, what, what we have to get clearance on for that will not impact us having to get a playground. Correct. But if we, if there's fixes that we have to do for a playground and or a shade structure, they may be sometimes the same. So we might be killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, please. Um, so um, there's been a lot of discussion with you not being able to show projections. I don't think anyone's wanting specifics, but as a public, you had to make assumptions to get there. So it'd be nice to see like I envision or I project this being at Auburnell, this being at Evie Kane, this being there, because you had to use that to get those projections. Um, and that's where I think nobody is seeing the difference because if you have a band teacher or have to hire three band teachers, that's more than what we have right now. Um, so that is where I think the board from what I was hearing them talk about and myself as a parent would like to see and I would hope you guys would want to see that before you make such a big decision. Um, the difference in attendance, is that by grade or was the eighth graders that left a larger class than the sixth graders that came in? Or is that kind of across the board? So that would be a question of on that 50 something kid difference. Is it because that class coming in was smaller itself from last year? So like if they were 200 and now they're 175 kids of that same year, then we know we lost 25 students or were they already 175 and they're now 170. So is that where, where are those breakdowns to actually see, are we losing kids because it's a comprehensive middle school or are we losing kids or we just didn't have them to begin with going in there? Um, altogether, the foothills have a declining enrollment. I was at a rotary meeting where Gail spoke. Have we talked with other districts about their struggles and do we need to look at it combining all together? I would hate to see that happen, but I also don't want Gail to come in and take over because that means my child and the children that are here aren't going to want to come back and raise their kids here. So I think altogether there needs to be, everything needs to be looked at before we just make one big jump at this, at this meeting. There's a lot of things that I've never heard discussed. Um, and so, and for surveys, the last time I spoke last year, I asked you guys to survey incoming parents on why we were bringing, that's never been brought up. So I, and the last survey that went out was during COVID, which everybody's emotions were all over the place. So I really think that is an invalid survey. Thank you for your time. And ma'am, I'm sorry, not you. Um, I, I don't recall your name, but if your comment was about this, this agenda item, please, we'd like to hear it. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pull, pull just a point of privilege to use the little ladies room. I so, apologize. Uh, with that, then let's take a 10 minute recess. It's 927. Let's resume at 938. Because uh, I don't know how many seconds we got on that then. Okay.
It was 9.38. We'll be back in session. Are there additional clarifying questions at this time? Oh, I just wanted to clarify something. I, I had made a comment earlier that I, I felt like there, this was chaotic. And I don't know if chaos is, chaos is one word, maybe upheaval is one, just that with the changes that our district has had to go through, um, I'm potentially asking my kids to go to one school that closed in, in year one, they're attending a second year in year two, and that we might be subject to a change based on our geographic location in year three. So that's, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of change. And I think, um, I think one of my main regrets I have about this process is that, I mean, and it's hindsight that I can say this, that I wish if we knew that what was in the budget, um, the budget committee recommendations was absolutely what we had to implement, that we didn't just make those changes and 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 make and implement that because we've spent all this time seeking stakeholder input. We went through the FRIP process. We had a different um, recommendation from the committee. The board took action. And now we're back here a few months later and we're we're um, considering a significant um, change from what we've just implemented. Um, and so I feel like we we've it's it's been a divisive um, process at times and it's been a lot of um, it's been it's been kind of like this heart this wrenching process that we've all gone through and we're right back where we started with the budget committee. And I know the leadership has changed. I'm not, I'm not like trying to point fingers, but it's just, it's been this kind of tumultuous process to arrive at the same point of the budget committee's recommendation that we had in, what was that like February or March, 2022. Yeah, March 16th, and so th that's part of what I struggle with in this is that um, we allowed for such an extensive stakeholder process had a particular outcome and I don't know that the yes we talked about this last month and we're talking about it again but I I don't know that the community is is keeping up with where we are right now and so I think that some people are feeling caught off guard with we thought things were settled we have our three new schools we're all trying to get um, acclimated in our new environments and now we're talking about another change so um for those reasons and um, what I would like is that um, um, I move that we postpone this matter until we receive a detailed plan of projected savings um, and identification of what level of cuts are still needed given the cuts that we just took tonight and an outline of educational programs that could be offered under a different model. I'll second that motion. Trying to write it down. I, I can write it down for you. Okay. Okay, so we've got one motion on the table. Um, and I've got a clarifying question on that. Um, for the interim superintendent, can you estimate even just ballpark how many hours of staff work that would require to put together, you know, what those potential educational programs would be, what the savings would be, um, and all the rest? You know, I understood. Earlier, you said, you know, you'd have to work with the principals, the principals to develop that plan. So how can you ballpark how many hours that would take the principals out of what they're doing right now in the school sites to work on this plan before it's something that the board acts on? I mean, to develop a comprehensive plan that details what you're asking, um, the principals would need to put some thought into it, meet with me. They'd have to consult with their staff and their families. I mean, it, it could be a considerable amount of time um, over at least a couple week span if we worked every day on it a little bit. Um, it's hard to ballpark just right now on, on the spot, but it wouldn't be something that we would have a principal meeting and then have, have an answer for you. Um, what I can tell you is that all of our students would have access to all the core subjects and electives. And we have electives at our middle school right now that we could bring to all of our campuses. So I just wanna remind the board of that. Um, when you talk about educational program, the program 
my the way it's implemented might look a little bit different because it's three different campuses, but it's still the, you know, it's the same educational program. We're we're um we're bound to provide that to our students. Um, as far it so going back to your question, um, how much detail would you want? Would you want a sketch of approximately? I mean, every student would receive. ELA and math and science and social studies and then the the elective options but I I wouldn't even be able to say for a fact that those would be the elective options that we would offer when school starts because what do the kids want I mean principal Mayberry herself has gone to all the fifth grade students to ask them what electives they want that took her weeks to get to all the campuses and then create the schedule and find the staff for it and create the plan and get the funding together um, and that's just for, that's just to give student choice to electives, to choose which electives she's going to offer. And she does that each year. I mean, um, you know, assigning an, an hourly time to it is, is really difficult. I'm going to be honest, but it, it would take a lot of uh, time and effort. And I, and I would have to pull the principles. I can't do that for them um, and their sites. They know their sites better than I do. And is it? Trustee Ross, is there any way to um, to harness this into something such as like, what's it going to take to move the, you know, like we had a laid out plan that we were going to get moving trucks and we were going to move, you know, these boxes and these teachers were going to do this from this time to this time. I mean, just something so that we can figure out what the impact this will have. So the, so we, we set up the system for moving already. We have, you know, we, we, we know how to order the boxes. We even have boxes. Yeah, um, we, we have the labeling system, how much staff time depends on, um, you know, once we, once we draw the attendance boundaries, what the need's going to be, you know, how many projected more students will be at one site than the other. Will we need to move a significant amount of people that those are all things that we have to do as we advance through um, the implementation of, of the program. I, I'm not sure if I'm capturing yeah, no, what but, you're asking. Um, yeah, more or less like, do we need students? How many physical students do we need to move? How many teachers would we have to move? What what would that kind of look like if we do have one art teacher um, as opposed to three different art teachers at the school? Like just a little more about that, like people, where are so, the people going to be placed? How, what does that look like? Sure students if we don't get enough students that want to go to ev Kane, then what's what's that step look like so we'll we'll have attendance boundaries right like we currently do so we aim to be a district that, that allows parents to go to any school they wish within our district but we do have a hard backstop of we have district boundaries so we would have to have the attendance boundaries drawn and see what our numbers are i know that we have a larger campus at eb kane which could could potentially house um well could house more students um so that would be something that we would um look at um, if we're concerned about, you know, the number of students on our on our other two K-5 campuses and we have more space at, at a third campus, that would be something that we would definitely look at. Um, as far as movement of staff, we would have to move some middle school staff to each of the elementary sites to make them K-8 and some elementary staff to the 6-8 site to make it K-8. So there would be some movement. It's not the same as what we had to do this year where we um, moved two entire campuses. Um, and as you know, I'm sure you know, um, because I know that Heather reported this out, even when we consolidated the two sites, we said school choice and students can go where they where they want families choose for them to go. Um, we had some projections of where we thought students would go. Um, we're not too far off, except that we um, projected way fewer students at Sky Ridge. We have, you know, way, way more enrollment over at Sky Ridge. So there are going to be those things that happen that we didn't really expect, right? We also projected projected that we would lose um, some elementary students based on, you know, um, some of the uncertainty people are feeling or the nervousness about the move. And we actually gained um, in, in a moment there. So um, even, you know, we, we made a lot of projections and project predictions last year. And, and some of those didn't even come out the way we thought they would. We weren't super far off the mark in some cases, but we were, off the mark because, because again, you know, we're just, we're projecting. So as, how, how would it look to move um, 
to make three TK8 campuses, it would look like there would be some movement of staff. There would be some movement of families. Um, and again, going back to the school choice thing, if a family is at one school site and does not want to move to the other, as long as there's space, we're not going to force it, right? We're not forcing students to move right now, right? We're taking students as parents are enrolling them um, as we have the space. Um, and then as far as program goes, will we need two art teachers or three? That depends on, do the students want more art? You know, and that's something that I'm going to find out throughout the year as I'm talking with students and I'm talking with um, families. What do students want more of? I couldn't have predicted last year that they wanted more after school sports at the elementary sites, but they did. And so we shifted our funding and our resources to, to give the principals the money to be able to give students that access. So as we're talking with students and we find out what the electives they want are, we're going to definitely try to add them within reason. So in other words, if we have VAPA at the TK5 level and we will continue VAPA, the TK5 program won't change. It's just going to be housed at all three sites. The 6-8 program, we're still going to offer the offerings to the students. So, you know, even I, I heard um, concerns about, um, you know, advanced classes and we're still working on the gate committee. All of those things are set to be um, part of the education we offer our students. We owe that to students. Students ju don't just learn, um, you know, at at the, the the level that we say they should learn because that's what we're doing. You know, if the students need advanced math, then we have advanced. If they need gifted learning strategies, then we, we offer that. Um, if they need intervention, then we offer that as well. So again, you know, what would that look like in terms of movement? We will still have the K-5 and the 6-8 staff on each campus and then working within what the need is and through MTSS and through the principals sharing data, we'll develop that master schedule piece. And I know that you said that you weren't looking for an exact master schedule, but what you're referring to is what we call the master schedule in the program world. That is the master schedule. Um, and then sticking to, you know, the strategic plan that the board has, has adopted and put in place, you know, really focusing on, um, those core, you know, visual arts, uh, performing arts, um, that, that type of thing, that's something that the board, um, and the community developed in making that strategic plan and those smooth transitions through TK-8 is what we're looking for. So if we have VAPA at TK-5, we wanna continue, pull out the components of the VAPA program, but continue through those electives at the middle school so students can get to that advanced level and then make some, some decisions for high school. So if we could, I would like to try and move kind of into the debate part on, on this motion then. Um, so Clerk Brigler, do you have any more that you'd like to add? You, can, you kind of introduced, I think, your argument um, when you introduced the motion. Um, yeah, just that I'm, I, I would like to revisit how much is it that we need to cut. I, I, I asked for, you know, where are we in terms of how much we have to cut? Um, I'd like to have a better understanding of how this um, TK-8 plan, um, how savings are projected. And um, what would it look like? I said educational program. So what would what would that look like for our students? So if you are, I mean, with a focus on, we're saying the TK five program remains intact. So what happens for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders if they are split and they're they're being educated at three campuses? Um, how is that being offered to them? I and mean, I think one of the big benefits that parent or one of the reasons parents value um, a school like E.B. Kane is that um, it's a good preparation for high school, that students have the opportunity They're you know, like they're rotating through classes in a manner similar to what they will experience at Placer or elsewhere. So are they still, you know, rotating? Um, do they still have opportunities for differentiation? Um, how, how do you... Um, how do you staff a class like um, math for students who need more of a challenge? Understood. Yeah. Uh, this, this present hold, I, and that's I think some of my I I argued pretty strongly against moving away from a comprehensive middle school mm -hmm. just several months ago, um, and those were some of my concerns then. Um, I went and I talked to some of the staff, and I was concerned about how can we replicate some of these programs? How can we get this across the different sites? Um, and kind of as the year has gone on and 
you know, in the conversations like with Gail and Stern lectures from Gail and, you know, and also looking at our financial situation here, it, I have a hard time seeing how we can continue to push some of these decisions off. And I think when we did retain EV Kansas in middle school, I think one of the things we said is we would revisit this, you know, this school year at some point. Um, and, you know, whether, which, whichever way it went. And yeah, it's looking at, you know, the roughly $400,000, you know, I, I wish we could have perfect information, but I don't think we ever can. Um, you know, we'll never have perfect information. We'll never have a total clear picture on what something would look like. Um, you know, the best we have is kind of the, the direction. That's, uh, I, 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 we just can't, you know, have that perfect, perfect world. I, trusty Ross, I don't think we're looking for that. I think what we're looking for, I mean, what came out of the superintendent's mouth was uncertainty. And we are basing a whole pro, we're changing our whole entire district based on an uncertainty. And I think that's what gets me the most. If this was a million dollar save in money, I, I don't think it'd be a question to any of us. But the fact that it's maybe 400,000, maybe less, maybe more, that type of uncertainty, is it worth risking loss of students? Is it worth, worth risking loss of, of staff and employees? Is it worth putting our district in this whole fumble to try to figure out how to do this within eight months? I don't know if it's worth it based on the uncertainty of possibly $400,000. Well, this present all again, my suggestion there though, would be no matter which way we decide, you're running those risks. If you decide to keep it as a comprehensive school, if we decide to, to go that route, we're also making the same risks of deterring students, deterring families, deterring staff. You know, those th those are the same either way. That that, that sort of cuts both ways. Mm, I don't know, staff. I don't know. I I, I see, it, especially at EVK, and I've seen a huge turnaround in staff and the happiness this year compared to last year. Like I've seen the improvements at EVK specifically. Um, that to do something, I don't know. This is just a huge. This is going to be a huge process, and something's it's kind of it's it's actually kind of working. I, I'm I have to say that I'm very proud of Miss Mayberry and what she's put forth, and I don't think any of you are not proud. I just have to say that I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been on the cap campus, and the improvement that has happened within the past year and a half has been huge because of what because of the people that are there on that campus, right? So now to go and mix it all up again because of an uncertainty it just i don't know that that kind of boggles me a little bit i just want to be clear that i'm not um opposed to a tk8 model um i actually had brought it up as part of the consideration but it was under kind of different circumstances too i was thinking about it more as um you know that it felt more kind of organic or natural to take the buy-in that families already have for their elementary schools and then allow those to grow gradually into um, into a, a K-8 program as like as one potential option. And um, now we're talking about, you know, taking kids out of their middle school and asking them to go back to elementary school. So it, I don't know, I just, I, it's just all about the implementation and how we, how thoughtfully we, we do this. And I don't know, I, I, I guess if, if it feels like we have no option but to pursue TK-8 to save the money that we need to to be solvent, then um, I would prefer you know, to take our time to plan this and to be really, I don't know that we have enough time to decide now and implement in the fall. I don't know if, um, I don't know if that's enough time to get it right. And that's, I, the longer we wait, the longer we push that out, though, too, right? So because we don't have the savings in the in that next year in the budget, but also, you know, if we postpone the decision further, you're saying you're not sure even if we decided right now if we would have time to implement it to, by the next school year, but that gives us less time in November, December next year, you know. So it's there's not going to be necessarily a better time to make that decision and make these make give them the best opportunity to make it work to start seeing those savings next year. What if we engage in a planning process with our community um, this year and learn about the options and and how this, you know, what this could look like 
we have a better understanding of what families want and and try to align our resources to um, you know what their priorities are. I, I just think there's a way for us to engage the community and figuring out how to do this um, and bring them along with us. Because I think to a lot of people, this may feel abrupt. And um, after going through this planning process last year, and um, I, I just I, I just want to be really thoughtful about this, this decision. It seems like we've, we've already been through so much. And then to kind of shift gears back to TK8 um, without understanding what it would look like is hard for me. You know, we haven't had the chance to hear from you. Do you have any? Um, it's uh, Trustee Grigsby. Um, the only two things that I've noticed about this is um, um, my biggest concern is we heard even from maintenance that um, we're having an, a staffing issue. Um, if we have to it, either get two or three for one to three schools, and we're having trouble right now, are we going to have more troubles? And what are those students going to have to work with? Or how are we going to create that classroom without the staff for it? Um, the other thing that I was really trying to, to think about is, has there been any other districts? I mean, not even close, but I mean, that that have had to do something like this and either struggled or succeeded. Have we, do, do we know of anywhere minus LA because that's a terrible to, uh, one to describe, but um, any other districts that either were struggling or had to, to combine for, for different reasons. I mean, do we know if it was a success, if it was a, a failure, if, it, if they would change it in this way, if they had to redo, you know, I mean, have we heard anything about that? I mean, was there any, anything about that in any of the that I've noticed I haven't seen anything but I've also no haven't noticed that there's been like articles about this district had to combine blah 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 except for that one that closed down in LA yeah yeah I'm not aware of any case studies but I haven't looked so yeah it'd be helpful to learn from other districts that have considered going back to K8 or going to K8 I do know, uh, Trustee Ross, that when um, Vice President Wedge and I attended CSBA, there was a huge um, conversation about a lot of the middle schools closing and becoming K through eights, but I don't know that we heard what the impact of that was. So this is a huge move that is happening all over the, which can work for us in two ways, right? We can look at it and say, well, wow, great. Now we're, we're one of the only middle schools in this huge location. So maybe if we make our marketing right, we can attract students that want that because we're the one of the only ones that offer that. Or we can look at it and say, everybody else is doing this. Is this what we need to do? Yeah. That's uh, Vice President Wedge. I'll go ahead and chime in before we go to vote. Um, <clears throat> couple things I've been looking at um, is that uh, one that is really concerning is that over the, you know, um, I don't know if you have those numbers available, but over, you know, a multi-year uh, um, trajectory, we've seen a consistent drop in EVK in middle school. And, um, and that trend has not changed at all. It's actually getting worse. And uh, to your point, um, Trustee Ross, uh, it is a trend going in California. Um, comprehensive middle schools are, you know, are closing. And uh, the position we're in, we're out of time. And we knew going in this year that we we're going to have to make drastic decisions. And I think the quicker we address these, um, you know, these uh, these issues and these decisions, you know, the faster we can come up with the plan and uh, and move past them. And so. Um, and then the third point I want to make is that um, I was having a conversation with the uh, um, SRO, um, school resource officer, and, and I asked her a question. I said, so what's your hardest school that you deal with, you know, with the most issues? And it was flat out EV Kane was the hardest one. So. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. This, this isn't. Ma so. Back right now. 
you know, but 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 bottom line, you know, to the board, you know, and to you know the community is that we knew going in this year that we had to make hard decisions. The quicker we make those hard decisions, we're in this spot right now because these should have been made ten years ago, and and they and they were not made. They were pushed out. They were pushed out. They were pushed out. And um, so we have a choice to make. We can we can stay in that same pattern, and uh, you know, and we can end up being you know at risk of uh, not being solvent, then we don't have local control and, um, or we can make those decisions that are necessary so we can remain no con uh, local control. And some are going to like it. Some are not going to like it. And uh, no matter how much research, how much data um, that we put into it, you know, you're still going to have that split where some are going to like it. Some aren't going to like it. And I agree that we have to make decisions. I'm glad you said that. We also have to make the right decision for our community. Right. This is not just our schools. This is our community. So this doesn't just affect our district. When we were going through consolidations, I went and chatted with Placer High School and I said, hey, Placer High School, how will a K through eight affect you? And they said that our students that come from Evie Kane are the most prepared students that they have come into their high school. So I think it's it's not just affecting us. Like we have to reach out to other people that this is going to affect. And so making the right decision is going to be crucial. Yes, we have to make a decision, but it has to be the right decision for our community, right? And if I could, I'd just like to remind everybody right now, trying, we're trying to keep it to the merits of this motion, right? So the motion to table or not to table. And so I understand some of these points are talking about timelines and that, but if we just make sure we keep it to that. Okay. With that, is, is there any further debate on that motion? Then we move to a vote. Um, clerk, 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 I don't have it in front of me. Would you okay, mind here. reading the motion? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I move we postpone this matter until we receive a detailed plan of projected savings, cuts, I should say required cuts, I said cuts needed, and educational programs. Probably could have worded that a little bit more eloquently, but that's what I said. Okay. Um, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. And those opposed? Nay. 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 All right. So moving forward then, um, I move that we adopt, uh, that we approve item 8 <laughs> Um, to implement dis implement district wide TK eight, um, that would be starting in the next school year. All right, and this, I'm not seeing a second, so it can it can die. But... This is a uh, vice president wedge, and um, with my recent uh, remarks that uh, we need we need to we need to make drastic decisions. So um, I'll go ahead and set. Second that one. So for some of the reasons I've discussed, we need to give the district the most time possible, give families the most time possible, make the hard decisions now and be able to be prepared going into the next year and not repeat what we did last year where we were scrambling in February and March and getting into May, um, making decisions about the coming school year. Or even June, I think we were discussing still what school would look like. Um, Clerk Brickler, I think the challenge is, um, I understand we have to make difficult decisions. And when um, this matter was voted on last year, I understood and tried to make the point repeatedly that we weren't cutting as much as we said we would cut and that that was going to be a problem down the road. But I don't know that I have enough evidence to say that this is what is going to make us solvent, that this action is going to be um, in the best interest of the district and that it's going to um, solve our problems. So I, it, um, when, when I hear folks say that, you know, we need to make the hard decisions. Um, I think we also have to be strategic about which hard decisions we make. So I don't know that, I don't have enough information to know if this is um, the right decision or not. This president will be, and, and I share your concerns about bringing those families into Kane. 
I do. Um, because, you know, to populate those different grade levels, you know, is that something that's going to work? Um, and you know, I trust that, I think there are a lot of families that will, um, you know, there, there is going to be probably a brand new playground facility. There are going to be some other new things there. Um, you know, and that could be that opportunity to kind of rebrand cane that I know that's been requested, um, because it would be, it'd be now an elementary school, um, you know, in a TK3 program, not a comprehensive middle school. So, um, like I said, when we were kind of asking questions, you know, we'll never have that perfect information. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, if anything, I wish that, you know, I had, you know, pushed for this before. I hope to make it work, but I, I haven't seen how we can make like the comprehensive middle school work. Okay. Um, and I, I haven't seen, um, other than public comment tonight, um, I haven't seen really other suggestions about how to go forward to structure those schools. I mean, one suggestion that has been made is, um, you know, can we keep the comprehensive middle school, but shift, um, you know, other grade levels could, could grade re um, reconfiguration look like adding fifth grade or fourth grade. But I think from what we're hearing tonight, what we've been told is that that doesn't result in savings. Well, but I, I, but I but see I I also don't feel like I have the data I would need to understand. Well, and this is President Hall. I think that that would get us right back though into the fears that people had about sending their younger kids to Kane, because Kane right now as a comprehensive middle school does have more of the discipline problems, has the other issues. There's there's a stigma, right? Um, and when we had people who were going from potentially altruistic community charter school, you know there were concerns that they didn't want to send their younger kids there. I think we would see those same problems if we were to ask fourth and fifth grade students to be going to Kane earlier. I think we'd run into the same issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I, I think it would be incredibly helpful if we had more time to study this and have better information in order to make this decision. This It, it feels like it's come up really quickly, right? It's been talked about for a long time and yet um, it came... So uh, we we asked administration to um, recommend some additional cuts. We first saw a list last month, and now we're voting on it tonight. So um, without a clarified plan, which is what I had asked for in my motion. So I mean, I, I think I've been clear about more detail, um, more evidence for how this saves us money would be um, is is what I would need to be able to support this. Um, I would just like to ask a question to our board members if they have been to the campuses this year and walked around them and sat down and talked with principals to see how things have been affected by the last decision we just made. Because it would be really nice if we could actually go to the schools that we're going to affect and see how things are working before we make a new plan to work, right? And so, trust you, Ross, too, we need to keep it to the merits of the motion right now, not about what people are or have or haven't done. So. I, I'm just not sure how to make a decision. If you have not been to a school, you're making a decision based on a school that you have not been to. It's very relevant. If you have not been in these classrooms, if you have not seen how they operate, then it's really hard to make a decision that is going to affect the life of all these students. Trust you, Ross, you're not making a like an argument though. You're saying that we, we we don't know if you haven't been to a classroom? That's not what I said. I said, you don't know the effect that you just made on the last decision because you haven't been to the classroom. And now we're making a new decision that will impact our students, but we don't even know what the last decision impact had on our students. And so it's really hard. And so my argument again is, yes, we should wait. I, I don't care if it's a month or two months, like we should wait until you're actually have seen what's going on and that we can see a plan of what will happen. Renee, trustee Renee brought up an incredible, uh, we don't even have the staff for maintenance and we're making a huge decision that's going to affect our maintenance that we don't even have enough staff for. Then make a motion to table this for a month. We did, I make a motion to table this for a month. There's a motion. I'll second. A second? All right. So, this is President Holt. Um, 
you know, if we were to table this for a month, that still gives CBO time based on the estimates she gave us to be able to get things put in place for EVK and if that's what we we're going to ultimately do. Um, so uh, is there any further debate on that motion, the motion to table this decision for a month? Can we add to that motion? You make a friendly, make a friendly amendment. amendment. Um, can can we try and do um, the uh, survey idea, see what um, idea. community members would prefer? Um, I, I know it was a little bit difficult to get out of district community members, but the ones that aren't in our district because we don't have the K through eight or because of the EVK X, X EVK stigma. Is there a way we could get a very K through eight survey done and have those results for the next meeting? I need that for you. <laughs> Shorter. <laughs> oh, it was a friendly amendment, right? So it, yeah. the motion was I move that we table this for a month and then you were adding to allow for a community survey or a, for a survey. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> for a survey of preference. So for to allow for preference. That sounds right. And is there any further debate on that on that motion? Can I add friendly? Can I do another friendly amendment to the friendly well, amendment? It's up to you. Um, well, I, I think just generally speaking, we were saying we want to table this for a month so that we can gather more information. I don't want to be restricted to just a survey. I mean, it would be helpful to have more I think that's the information we already have from last year, though. Uh, that was the main thing that we didn't have. Uh, e even just a little bit of detail about, um, you know, what this might look like on, on each of the three sites or some of the things we've discussed tonight about wa wanting to have, um, I guess it goes back to my original motion. I, I really still don't know how much we have to cut, whether or not I, um, whether or not the $400,000 is achievable in savings from this plan. So, I, I mean, I just I just think we're, the, the move to table I was hoping would just be to, for general information gathering, including a survey. Well, the motion is to to table this action item for, for a month. And it sounds like the friendly amendment that was accepted was to allow time for survey. Um, and I think that also gives us as trustees a lot of time to to try to ask some more questions. Okay. Obviously, we can't impose a whole lot of staff time, um, but there are certainly some other questions to be asked. Um, yeah. To, to I, I can I can leave it with where it is with the um, table for a month to allow for a survey. Okay. And um, before we move to vote on that motion, is there any additional debate? Seeing none. Um, all in favor of the motion to table uh, agenda item eight F for one month uh, and. Uh, not not necessarily to allow for survey, but um, and um, have the district conduct a survey about the TA key, TKA. I'm sorry, could you read it? I'm oh, just, I don't have it in front of me. Um, Trustee Ross moved. Um, she said, I move that we table this for a month. Friendly amendment added the language to allow for a survey of preference. <clears throat> Here, I have everything. Okay. okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? All right, so we four in favor and the motion carries. So uh, that, you know, we don't have to vote on the other one. Um, so this will be tabled for a month. We'll resume that one in November. Moving to item 9A, board governance. Um, we're discussing board policy, administrative regulation 5141.6 school health services. CSBA has made changes to board policies in June, 2023. Uh, the board received the first and the second read. And, um, um, one of those changes was BP and AR 5141.6, which involves school health services. Per board request last month in September at the meeting, uh, changes were pulled for further discussion. Um, so this is an opportunity for the board to discuss BP and AR 5141.6. 
And Vice President Wedge, you asked to pull that, sure. um, sir. Correct, I like did. Start our discussion there, please. Yes. Um, so first I wanna thank um, uh, Michelle for uh, getting the legal uh, opinion on that. Um, and uh, so that came back as that, that will be um, you know low impact to the uh, district if we did not accept it. And um, when you look over the uh, policy as it is written now, um, pretty much the way this this new language is, we are already providing the services that uh, that these uh, changes um, are uh, are implementing. Um, one concern on that is that when you um, when you read through some of the language, um, for instance. For instance, um, it says this this district shall so serve as a medical provider to the extent feasible, comply with all related legal requirements, and seek reimbursements and costs and ex and to the extent allowed by law. And um, just where we are with the district right now is that uh, you know with the uh, changes that we've already made and updating changes we have is that this potentially um i see as diverting um resources that that is better fit in uh you know um you know for education purposes and uh and so that's why i pulled it because it's uh it doesn't it doesn't do anything other than pull res that potentially can pull resources away and um and we are already providing these services as a district as it stands uh Trustee or Br Trustee Brickler, may I comment? My understanding of how Medi-Cal billing works in school districts is that schools have historically provided services that um, that would be appropriate for Medi-Cal billing, but schools were not set up to be reimbursed for those services. And there there's been a movement to um, recognize that schools are an important um, that they provide a lot of health services and they should be reimbursed by the Medi-Cal program. So Correct. I think it's actually a, a revenue um, source for schools when they are able to, um, that we're being able to be reimbursed for something that we're already providing. So I don't think it diverts resources. I think if anything, it brings additional resources in. I think that's why we're doing the, like the Medi-Cal, the, the, the MA, right? The MAA is the, um, the process of being reimbursed for Medi-Cal eligible services. Yes. It's a recognition that we've essentially been functioning um, as a as a health clinic in some settings because we do things like provide hearing screenings to all students. And so it's now there's a mechanism for us to be reimbursed for those. And so I, I see it as a benefit to the district. We wouldn't be seeking reimbursement for health, like audiology, right? Or like, I don't know if audiology training. would be an example. I, I, but there are services that are medical eligible that are provided in school settings, and yeah. schools used to front the cost. My is my understanding, and now they can be reimbursed. But is there someone who, on from administration, who'd like to clarify? Um, thank you, CBO Leslie. Um, so we we have been working under the the MA program or the the Medical Reimbursement Program, and it's been for very select um, hours of um, particular service providers. Um, and I don't know necessarily that it's it's been one of those like um, where they talk about you know like receiving copays or anything like that. I think it's just something that as the state of California that we can take those and then um, we have to detail. It's some pretty significant accounting um, to detail out um, wages and hours that those um, did, and then we essentially like you said submit it for reimbursement. And that's about my maximum level on that. Yeah. So as I looked at it too. Um... You know, one of my concerns was actually it wasn't mentioned in the the summer we got, um, but a new addition was to add that uh, school health services offered by the district may include, um, but not limited to, uh, reproductive health services, and that's a euphemism for abortion, and that always has been, and so I, for that reason, I absolutely reject this, um, and I reject adopting this. Uh, 
edition. And um, and to add to that, oh, are you suggesting that we're offering abortion services at um in our schools? No, I'm suggesting right now, as I understand it, state law is that a student could check themselves out to receive abortion, anyways. Um, but I reject that we would add this language. <laughs> if we have to already, great. If it's already law, great. But if we don't have to add language expressing essentially that the district supports it. Um, then, then uh, I don't want to have to adopt it. And also want to add to this, um, you know, there's a lot to this. And uh, and this, you know, especially with, the, there's a lot of added behavioral health and whatnot, you know, throughout all this. And um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we already outsource those services. And, uh, and this is going, you know, we're already having uh, um we're already having a problem of retaining staff and uh, and whatnot, and this is going to put added pressure on the superintendent, on the schools, and on the principals to have these services. So basically, this is setting up the framework to um, to have health clinics at schools, and um, and I don't think we're ready for that yet. You know, at least here at Auburn Union School District. Um, can I ask a clarifying question? How will this impact our special education is there any way that this funding can be used towards special education to counteract those costs can we get some of those reimbursed by this like because that seems to be a huge cost to our district and if we could alleviate some of those costs through this that would be phenomenal i don't think we're receiving any funding from from this language or whatnot i think if anything this is going to uh you know, take away from resources, you know, that, that we're already um, offering. I'm not sure. And when it comes down to special education, if you can get a reimbursement that we don't have to pay for, that would be huge, especially as we're sending students outside of our district to get. If I may, I, I think I have a question that kind of ties into that then, um, and probably for the CDO. Are we currently spending money on um, off campus clinics, mobile counseling services, or similar district arranged locations for student health services? Uh, CBO Leslie, um, with that particular wording, I'm going to have to say that no, we're not. I mean, because we really employ, um, you know, we have our, our school nurse um uh in our which is you know basically our, our medical coordinator or health coordinator and we also have um open positions for lvns uh, so those are in-house so it's not really like necessarily mobile clinics i think the only thing that's mobile that i'm aware of is the hearing screening van that is is typically serviced so um psychologists are in-house um counselors in-house and um the only other programs i think that would be off um they're on site, but they're not directly funded from the district as the, the grant funded wellness centers. So we don't expend to that. And the reimbursements that we would receive um, or that we currently receive from Medi-Cal are directly related to those that have to do with uh, nursing or health services, um, very particular um, types, and then also some of the psychologists. And we already do receive those reimbursements. Yes. The, the language references speech, vision, and hearing um, related services. Yeah, I also see where auxiliary aids um, services may include an element to providing written materials and alternative fonts, braille, large font, audio recordings, and closed captioning. But it seems like it's more of a function of making sure that kids have access to an education, if, right. you know, like by by addressing these kind of core health needs that could be a barrier. And, but that sounds like we are already getting reimbursed for Medi-Cal for that. If I understand CBO correctly. Oh, that, yeah. So yes. if we're already getting reimbursed and I don't see that we need to adopt the new language. I'm looking at page two under of, would... uh, <clears throat> the regulation. Um, this is Clerk Brickler, and I wouldn't want to be out of compliance with uh, a potential, you know, reimbursement source. There could be a financial impact to not having um, up to date language from a revenue source. 
uh, question, Trusty Ross, can we remove the part that you don't like? Like, can we move, remove the reproductive health service? If that's the only part you don't like, or is there more to it? Uh, so Vice President Wedge also had some points. Um, if, uh, you know, if we were to adopt just like the Medi-Cal billing portion, um, I can see that, but I also, you know, I can hear Vice President Wedge's concerns that this could be setting us up or making it look like the district is going to be able to provide more health services than we currently do, um, or to act as kind of a health clinic. Correct. Um, if, if, if we can provide services, it's great, but we're not in a position to try to offer a whole lot more right now. Um, we're a school, not a health clinic. Um, so I, 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 I don't see that as the intention of this, um, of this updated Clerk, language. I, I would suggest that it absolutely is. When you look at the policy, one of the changes they added was a philosophical paragraph to the first paragraph. That was one of the, the noted changes that are, mm -hmm. uh, that they said, which is that, you know, if we were to adopt it, we would say that this governing board recognizes that um, students should have access to comprehensive health services. The board further recognizes that schools are uniquely positioned to increase health equity and ensure that all students have access to necessarily necessary health care services. The district may provide access to health services at or near district schools, et cetera, et cetera. And that's so that 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 does go beyond just changing what we had before. I don't see why we would need to adopt this. Um, we can just retain the language that we had, unless that's already the language. But I believe it said that that new paragraph that was a new paragraph. Correct. It is. Yeah. So I, I don't see why we would need to change it. There's a it's lot of um, use of the word "may" in here. That they may the district may provide access. The district may utilize telehealth. So I don't think that it's binding us to something that. Um, I don't think that it's putting us in any sort of financial peril and making us provide something that we're unable to provide. I think that there are funding sources that cover things like audiology and and that we would be smart to utilize available funds to the benefit of our students. And that, you know, currently what it has, you know, the wording is says the district may provide access to health services at or near district schools through the establishment of school health centers and or mobile vans that serve multiple campuses. So we already have that language in here. So we're already providing a lot of these services. I think the only addition would be telehealth. Correct. Um, and I don't know that I've heard that we have a need for that at this time or no. that it would change significantly what we have. Um, you know, I think part of the danger of adopting it, you know, even if it just says may, right, is we still kind of offer it out there, um, but then we wouldn't necessarily be providing it or it would look like it's a subjective approval or not. Um, I just don't see the need to adopt the new language. Especially if legal said that there's not a downside to not doing it. Um, would you please reiterate what your concern is? What 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 are you... Um... Uh, what so, you, you use the word danger. So what do you see as the danger in this language? Oh, very well. I didn't realize I said the word danger. Um, it's, can you tell me what context I used it in? Was it, was it about, um, but just kind of making it appear that we'd be offering more than we can? I'm trying to remember it. You definitely said danger. We could go okay. back to YouTube later and listen. Um, of course. Okay. Um, but well, it's okay. You, I'll, you I'll, mentioned I'll the danger it. of you know, of um, you were concerned that we might be providing services that you don't agree with, which I, I don't see as something that's happening. Um, uh, maybe a danger of being seen as a health provider, um, a danger for being on the hook financially for something. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to. Okay. Well, then, then, then I'll go with it. Um, so without using the word danger, which I don't, don't, I don't deny that I said it, um, but right. Uh, I don't care for the philosophical paragraph that it suggests we add, um, you know, uh, that schools are uniquely positioned to increase health equity um, and ensure students have access to the necessary health services. I mean, that's, we are providing some of those, but it, I disagree that it's the role of a school to provide or to, to work towards health equity. Um, we should be most, first and foremost, focused on education, um, not healthcare. Uh, that is what our number one is. And then second, um, I don't care to adopt language that makes it look like the district supports um, or 
uh, is in support of um, providing reproductive health care um, to students. Um, uh, I think abortion is abominable. And uh, I think that many of the voters in our district um, agree. Um, just a question, Trustee Ross. Um, have you heard of Maslow's hierarchies of needs? Because it's very fundamental in something like this, where you say a lot of students uh, will have to focus on their security, their physical well-being, their mental well-being before they can even get into academics. You know, we spent the first two weeks of our school focusing on um, classroom management before we even went into academics. And so I just, I just agreed to disagree that I do think the health of our students is very important and making sure that they are healthy is going to put them in their seat and thus raise our ADD, ADA and keep it up. Um, so I, I, I do think that health has a big role to play and that I think we do have to make sure our students are getting the most adequate health possible. Um, in order for them to show up as their best selves. So I, I don't reject or I don't deny that it is important for students to be healthy. Um, that's first and foremost, the parents' responsibility. Um, and that, that that's what I suggest there, that it's first and foremost up to the parents to resolve that. And there are also other avenues throughout the state um, and in the county and other resources. So as a philosophy, as a philosophical statement, that's where my where I disagree with this first paragraph, that that shouldn't necessarily be going through the school. So I would suggest that as a school, we don't adopt it. It's incumbent on the school to be working to provide um to to try to attack that um that you know we already have a policy that we have uh, in there and i'm not arguing against the policies we currently have i'm suggesting we just keep that um hmm. and uh yeah um this is clerk brickler i think even if we were to look at it from just a strictly economic standpoint that there's a value in you know like healthier students are better able to fully participate in school and that it is a, a you know a more cost effective model of operating schools if if you can support students health and and they are you know in a better position to learn so um i don't know i just um i'm i'm trying to yes i know that there are other responsible parties in terms of keep, it's like a kind of a community overall that's like trying to keep our um create healthy environments for our kids and parents are uh, our caregivers are have the primary responsibility but um i think that schools are a place where um it's an opportunity you know for us to um support the whole student um and if there's op you know if there's like a funding source there's an opportunity why would we deprive a student of that so i, I don't know i i think that we are in a unique position um, to positively impact the lives of of uh, children in our communities, and we should do that whenever we can. Well, and I don't think anybody's in disagreement that you know health is really important, you know, to the students, and it should be really important uh, to the students. But there's other ways of getting there other than turning our school sites into a um, um, a health clinic. They're they're there, you know, and and here's another issue too. When when our school sites become a health clinics, you know, that has a potential also to remove the decisions, you know, that the parents can make, and so and that is a a really huge concern, and and we're already seeing it, you know, in other places. And, and I, I believe uh, there's a me. sure you have to. Yep, it I is. move that we extend the meeting beyond ten thirty p.m. All right, and I this present hold. I second the mo uh, the motion. All in favor. Aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, seeing none, it carries. Um, anyways, so <laughs> if, if I could, um, if there are any new points, um, let's please bring them forward to debate right now on this. Otherwise, I would like to get, I, I really do want to hear from who we have that still would like to speak to us tonight. Um, so um, I'd like to move to a vote. Um, and she. Oh, is there she's, another public yes, comment? Yes, she's been waiting for public comment that was for not on a board agenda item. Okay. Um, so, well, I, I don't think there's, this is Clerk Brickler. I have not, I don't think that by agreeing to this policy that we are signaling that we are operating health clinics out of our school. I just want to, and um, you, you're, you had another comment about does offering health services at campuses remove um, parent choice or 
limit parent decision making, but I believe that we typically have a process for parents being able to opt out. Um, I, I'm trying to remember last time one of my kids went to the hearing van. I think you have the opportunity as a parent to say whether or not you would elect for your child for to receive. The, um, so, for the 12 and under or under 12, I believe, but then our 12, 13, 14 year olds, there's different levels of um, patient confidentiality. Um, and so that, that, that could be removing those decisions from the parents, um, even though that, that happens to their doctor's office as well, but that would be between the parent, the doctor and the student, or, yeah. you know, their child and not getting us involved in that. Um, okay. So, um, um, well, I will move that we, um, approve the board policy changes, um, for BP AR 5141.6 recommended by CSBA in June of 2023. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. And those opposed? Nay. Nay. All right. And I will go ahead and make a motion and um, to not approve. Jason, did you? Oh, oh yeah. I didn't hear you. I was, no. Okay. Yeah. So. You didn't hear his nay? Uh, I did not hear your nay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You said it? Yeah. Oh, I'm make sorry. it loud, loud like a horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I, with that, actually, we, we don't need another motion. Um, okay. So we just aren't adopting that. And we're okay. retaining what we already had. Fair enough. Okay. So um, board direction, uh, update and requests. At the <clears throat> September 13th board meeting, the board gave direction on the following requests. Email an update on Williams Fit Report. Email an update on Community Schools Grant and Prop 28 Grant. Email an update on shade structures and water filling stations. Uh, move all budget reduction items needing board approval to the October meeting agenda. And provide an emailed update to the board on meeting end time and um, regarding drywall issues at Auburn Elementary. Since um, the one thing that was not an email is actually an action item, um, to my knowledge, these updates were provided with the exception of having a full update on community schools because I still have to meet with the CDE. Um, one thing that I did notice when I was going back through this update and, um, you know, lo looking at the grant proposal and all that is that the board has not approved the community schools grant uh, process. It, it was brought to the board as information and excitement, but it was not brought to the board for approval. So um, I still have yet to meet with the CDE employee. Um, I had to push that meeting out because something else came up that day. Um, that meeting, I believe, is next week. And once I meet with that um, CDE employee with, and I get more information, <clears throat> um, I can, I can um, you know, provide it to the board. And then new requests. Um, do we have any new requests this evening? Um, I do believe we have the request for the survey, which was an action item. Um, can we get a request of the breakdown in the budget where we're at and how much we are saved and how much more we need to make way for? Well, this president, Hull, it, but it sounds like that is essentially the first interim is what we would be asking for. Or are you just looking for like a, we're shooting for $2.5 million. We've identified one point or the superintendents identified 1.7. And this is how close we are towards that goal based on what we've made so far. That would be great. Cause I know at one point we had a Google doc, right. And so we can kind of see how it was all relevant. So, and okay. Yeah. So you're essentially just asking for a nice, easy bar graph. Okay. Well, a friendly amendment too. Are we sure that it, we are still beholden to 2.5 million? I think it's, is that still what we're required to cut that? Is like it was like a loose comment I heard in a meeting, and I would be good to verify. Mm. It was a when we were being, um, right. we were receiving stern language. There was a, during a, right. a the, stern, the, yeah, yeah. That that's essentially what we need to make those cuts to be able to remain solvent because we're not we're not trying to make decisions just for the next three years, but to be able to set the district on track to remain solvent. Right. Um, you know, barring the projected you know decline in enrollment. So. so I just, I'm asking for verification of that, that that is still accurate given the state of the unaudited actuals from last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, CBO, 
Um, CBO Leslie, I mean, I can um, inquire of the county. Um, I know, like I said, they were working off of the um, information um, from the fiscal expert that went through all of our finances um, for the past couple of fiscal years and then um, revised, you know, his own projections and worked very um, closely with us on the original budget. Um, you know, I, I don't know what that would look like for the county. I don't know if they'd want us to engage in some other in-depth process with that i think the um the 2 million 2.5 million um that we heard like i said was really based on what they anticipate we would need to cut based on continued deficit spending continued um increases and continued declining enrollment so just kind of how those two points kind of merge on a graph um so that can, would can i add to handle. that that it wasn't something spoken lo loosely in in one meeting this is something that we actually went through a process with the 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 financial advisor information was given to pcoe and with us this these are numbers that we were given going through all of the processes we went through last year to really figure out where we are fiscally so i i, I just want to make sure that um, the board and the public understands 2.5 wasn't just thrown out loosely at a meeting somewhere and we grabbed it and ran with it. That That's not what happened. It's actually um, through all the processes. We we had the FICMAT report. We had the financial um, expert from PCOE and that type of thing. So with that, with that being said, and understood too, I, I don't know that we need to ask them to re-verify that 2.5 figure. Um, you know, I said, we just look at how how close we are to getting there. I mean, if we, we've had the financial experts go through to help put that together, let's let's trust what they provided as a, as a target for us to hit. Um, so I actually found the language. It's in the report from the fiscal expert in the cover page. It um, cites Mr. Snelling's report and says, the overall general fund balance is projected to decline by more than 2.5 million per year beginning in 24-25. So, it, is that still the case? We are making these other. Um, is is well, that still accurate? Well, that of uh, of course that's going to change because if we've already made some cuts, well then we can take those cuts off, and I think that's exactly what you both, you know, what Trustee Ross was asking for too. So that's I think what we're all asking to see. And that's what we would just kind of go onto that, you know, whether it's a bar graph or however we put it on there. You know, if it looks like a little fundraiser chart, right? How close are we to the to the goal? Um, and, and that and that will be easy because it's in the fiscal impact for those two items today that we brought to the board for approval. Okay. So, so, so we we could probably get that to you and have that emailed before you um, leave to, for today. You know, if if that's something that the board would would like to have. We just need it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's don't, don't email tonight. It's already <laughs> getting late. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's there. So it's there. if we could clarify, then we are asking for just an update on where are we on those financial cuts that, you know, you've identified and as far as reaching that $2.5 million goal, how, how much progress have we made with the decisions that we've made so far? If, if I understand the request correctly, right. or okay. is that where we're at? Okay. I see one head nod. I don't see any head shakes. Okay. Uh, we go. Yeah. I, again, I just want to make the point. I don't know that 2.5 million is accurate. Even in the in the fiscal expert report, he has a number of qualifiers that you know that there are a number of things that could um, change the district's financial position positively or negatively, depending on um, enrollment and attendance and colas and um, you know various funds. So I, I just don't think that um, I think it's fluid, and I'm asking us to continue to track it. Well, and as a quick booker, I think it is fluid, but we could spend as much or as we could spend as much time as we could afford to give somebody to track that every day. And I think it would be different every day, depending on how finely you want uh, to do that. That's not what I'm asking for, though. I'm just just verification that that's still our target. That's all. I'm not I'm not asking someone to track it on a daily basis. I, I feel like tonight in a lot of our discussions, um, you know, we're provided with like one data point or a, a very limited plan. And the assumption is that if I ask for more information, I'm asking for like someone's dissertation on the, the concept. And that is not like there's there's somewhere in between that there's just a little bit more information, like a little bit more verification that could be provided that doesn't require a full time person tracking the numbers. So that, 
I was obviously being facetious to, to some degree there, but you know, just w- if we keep asking for it, it's going to keep changing because that target is going to change as we make cuts, right? So if we've identified two hundred thousand dollars in cuts, now we only need to cut two point three million, right? And then if we adjust enrollment, we adjust these other things, it's going to continually be a moving target. So I I would suggest that we, let's just work with that and see where we are towards the two point five million. Of course, it's going to change positively or negatively, um, but that's still the the number that we got from the county to work with. Um, that's what their experts that they paid for to come out here and look at our finances proposed. So that that would be my suggestion. Let's just go with it for now. It's only been several months. So are there any additional new requests? Um, I have a request um, that we mobilize more support for Auburn Elementary. Um, they have a particularly, they have the, the largest number of students of any school in our district and um, are asking for you know, more staff and um, um, just generally more support. Um, I also ask that we consider um, from what I, the little I know of the issue that just came up tonight is that it seems like it would be in the best interest of our district to just pay the principals seven days or five days, whatever it is, rather than having to pay for substitutes um, for staff to cover for her so um so can i just can we can i pause for a minute here we're, we're, we're talking about something that is completely confidential information and do you know that it's even valid i mean th- this is my concern right now is, is that we're talking about an employee in an open session meeting and and something that would be very confidential i wouldn't want ta- spoken about me in, in a public session i i just want to be cautious of that also, I, I would, I would, I, I mean, I would count it that that's probably not the board dis, board's discretion necessarily. Um, that that's within the superintendent and the principal's wheelhouse to resolve. Um, and if if we aren't satisfied with how the superintendent handles it, then that's what we can address with her. But otherwise, that it's entirely within the administration's purview to resolve how, whether it's uh, pay or whether it's time off. That that would be my suggestion. It's not the board's discretion to make those minute decisions can we make a request that that it's covered by someone who has an admin credential so at least that we're legal in terms of where we're at so whoever whatever happens and whatever if there's a break or not a break can it just be covered by someone who has the proper credentials that's the only request Uh, i i would just suggest that she's already going to make sure that whatever we're doing are following the law and and that we're consistent at each site Right. So that, that is something that we, we work out in HR. Um, the, the request that we pr- mobilize additional support for Auburn elementary still stands. And by support, can you please describe um, what you're asking for? I, I, I've been there. I've been there as a volunteer and um, I know they've been short staffed for um, lunch duty um, that, I think that we need to consider if there's a way to um, provide more administrative support to the school, given the number of students that they have on their campus, that they they have more students there than the middle school has. So here's my we, question. We since since we are, since we yeah. have already flown a position that we cannot fill, I, I, I'm, it's not like I, I don't agree with our schools getting the support that they need. Um, you know, but when you look at staffing ratios, how can I quantify adding another position or more positions to a site that doesn't meet that staffing ratio? So that's number one, especially when we're talking about making cuts here. And then two is, you know, how, how do I, so what am I supposed to do to hire this position? I mean, we're doing everything we possibly can. If nobody applies, how, how is this going to be an update that I can provide you just that I'm still trying and it's still falling short? I mean, what, what would the, what's the, um, the metric going to be here? So I understand exactly what's being asked of me. And that's let it, let us try to resolve and figure Thank out you. what this request is. So you're asking for more support, but yeah, what does that look like? You're saying another administrator, but we've heard that we have tried to hire a vice, you know, a vice principal, other administrators and haven't been able to. You know, the position is just unfilled. So what exactly are you suggesting that we request? Um, well, let's all try to reflect on what we what we heard earlier. We were hearing from staff, multiple staff, 
that, um, I mean, just that there aren't enough, there may not be enough adults available to supervise um, students and maintain, you know, like a safe educational environment. So that could be um, at various levels. It could be that it's um, supervising kids at lunchtime. It could be, because I, I know sometimes like the principal is being pulled in order to um, be in the cafeteria. So how can we kind of free her up so that she can do her job and so that the other essential roles are covered? So it doesn't have to be necessarily at an admin level, but um, I don't know if I'm asking to mobilize, like it depends on what so, the so, needs I mean, are of the site. So it sounds almost like duty? the, you know, I, I did make a request earlier, which is that the superintendent pay more attention and put a, a closer focus on the leadership and the administration at Auburn Elementary. Um, so that's, that would be my request that the superintendent now that you dig into that site and you resolve with whatever this issue is, wherever that issue lies, to start resolving it. Because if there's a problem with staffing or something else that needs to be resolved at that site, let's get to the bottom of it. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional new requests? All right. With uh, that I'm sorry, I have one more, which is just that we talked a little bit about projecting TK numbers. And um, I would ask that, I, I, I just don't think we ever want to, turn away families if we can help it. I understand that sometimes we um, are, we we may have like a, a program that's full and I'm, I just wanna advocate that whenever we can, we want to welcome families into our schools and not turn them away because especially a TK family could potentially stay in our schools for nine years. And so I'm just asking that whenever possible, we try to accommodate the families that are choosing our district. So is this a, um, so the, so because this is a new request and this is something we already do, what's the new part of the request? So I understand what you're asking of so me. So we're not turning away TK families that, because we don't have space. So if I have three TK families and I have to start a new classroom, that's one FTE for three families. When I'm, I'm over here saying these are my proposed budget cuts at the same time. So I, I need to understand so what is the policy then currently? The policy so is we have, it's 12, 12 to one is the ratio in TK. If we have, if we go over 12 and the 13th student, we hire an aide. Mm -hmm. So then that would be two to 24. And that's the current numbers that the state has given us. Now, if we have three TKs, no problem. We open a TK at our third TK site. We uh, staff it. We get kids in there. We don't have to turn kids away. Right now, we don't have that. We have two TK5s. We have two TK classrooms and they're fully, and they're full. I, I cannot um, hire one FTE, an entire FTE for a family that wants to come here. I wish I could. I I want to, is but that really that's not where we're at. I mean, is it really? It is. Um, I've seen TKK combination classes. Sure, but but then we still have to staff that TKK. So first of all, we have to look at what K we already have and how full they are. Second of all, at a, in a TKK combo, we still have to staff that um, that class to the TK ratios. Okay. So we're looking at two um, people in a TKK combo, a teacher and an aide, and 24 is the cap because currently right now it's two to 24. And I think we've had those in the recent past too. We have had those. So and then what happens is, um, you know, if, if we get more TK, then, you know, then we have to potentially turn them away or if our TKK class is full or if we can split it out, we've done that. And that, Absolutely. I think that's what I'm getting to those. I, I believe the district's already doing their best to try to accommodate those but sometimes right now we can't because we can't hire full-time employees to accommodate one or two families. And <laughs> I'm, well, I, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that you hire, go out and hire a new FTE for a single TK student. I just. So, so, so then what is the request? You, I want to ensure that we're not turning families away. I, I'm hearing that there are times when we're not 
accommodating them and I don't know enough of the detail to know what the staff I, I haven't, are. Okay. Thank you. I, I haven't heard that. So this is new to me, which is why I'm asking. So if there's somebody that was turned away, that's potentially one family, that's one student and our TK program is full. That's why. And, and I don't want to turn kids away either. And I understand the importance of TK, the TK program, which is why we have it at both of our sites and potentially a third site, if that's the direction we're going. Um, but right now our, our classes are full and I, and I can't hire one person for just a couple of students or one student or whatever the case may be. I wish we were in different times. And I hope to get us to the point where we can be in different times. That that's really what this, you know, that's really what I'm trying to do here. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understand the request. So uh, I, 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 I don't. To whenever possible or whenever feasible, let's welcome families into our schools, given staffing constraints. Okay. Well, clerk, 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 we already do that. So I, I'm, we don't need to make that as a new request. That's it's fine. It was just like it's a philosophical. I just we don't have the and chance then we to just wasted ten different... minutes on it, on a philosophical like for something well, we're already doing. Well, we've already so, wasted ten minutes talking about a philosophical disagreement about whether or not kids deserve health care. That would be schools. something yeah. if, that we were going to adopt. So yeah. okay, are there any additional new requests? Eleven o'clock, and I should have eaten more today. <laughs> All right. So that being said. Ma'am, please and thank you. Can I do it sitting down? Um, could you please the mic? Yeah, you could bring it to you. Um, but um, I am a parent at Auburn Elementary, ex-parent of Rock Creek. My children are in kindergarten and second grade. Um, my daughter scored ninety-eight percentile in the nation on her classes or the tests that um she's a pretty smart kid you guys want her in your district however um there's been a decline in her interest in um, extracurricular activities since being at Auburn Elementary I went in um, very open-minded and um, in support of the merger and that being her new school um, however the first day of school we were met with angry neighbors within um the vicinity literally the first day of school the first assembly welcoming all the families in they're on the stage there and you know welcome families here's this angry neighbor talking about how they don't want us driving on their private roads um there's been a lot of issues with traffic um it's a huge concern um i remember at one point that everybody on the board um signed saying that it wouldn't be a problem as part of the merger but it's a huge issue um also the fact that there's no water available to the students on the playground currently um, while they're having recess, they have no access to water. Um, the bathrooms are at a different um, location than where the children are participating in recess, which then sends them to an unsupervised location. My children have both um, been in situations multiple times now where they were unsupervised and things have happened in the bathroom um, that I think is inappropriate. They're there's um, a general just lack of um, staffing and supervision and safety for the kids. Um, I wasn't aware, and I would have brought this up a lot sooner, Rock Creek, um, their kindergarten program went from eight o'clock in the morning till three o'clock with the rest of the kids, the way the kindergarten set up here at Auburn Elementary. Um, they are out of school at 1.50, um, which leaves a lot of um, idle time where those children could be getting um, an education as opposed to just sitting at Boys and Girls Club. I know that that as a parent, you know, is my responsibility and I'm blessed to have that, but I would have liked to have seen my son get that education that Rock Creek was providing and I would have brought it up as a problem earlier, which you guys would have maybe been able to solve. But I'm thinking not only of my children, but the children in the future. I think that Auburn Elementary should have the K students there till three o'clock as opposed to 150. Um, my concerns with what's happening currently with the transition go beyond my three minutes. There's been multiple times where adults, staff and visitors have said, oh, those kids, if those kids weren't here, um, 
I just don't think that they're getting the support. And I do know that this is going to be bumpy and I am very open-minded and willing to help in any way, but I don't feel like there's going to be or has been enough support for this huge transition and the fact that all of our children are condensed in that one location, they should be receiving more resources than they are. And my other concern with turning all of the schools into a K um, through eight program, um, middle, middle school children and teenagers participate in experimenting with all kinds of different things and exposing our small children. If we can't even supervise just our small children currently at the location, how are we going to bring in hormonal teenagers and throw them in with our little babies. And last, just one more thing, if you give me 10 more seconds, I chose to live in Auburn. And I know that the school board is separate from our city town hall board, but I chose to live here because we don't have a Walmart and we don't have those cameras on our lights. And because it reminds me of how I lived when I was younger. And I think that's the consensus of this community is that we want to give to our children and our neighbors and ourselves something different than what the rest of the trajectory of this world is going. And I feel that we need our school board to be on that same consensus as our town is in terms of giving our children the education that we had as opposed to just throwing them all together um, with teenagers and young ones and I think that um, we need to have more humility with our decisions um, and ask more of what it is that the parents and families want as opposed to what just makes it look like we're moving forward quickly and like I said I have more but that was so thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank and, you. Oh, and the public comments should be opened up again and being read and um, not, it seems like a dead or silencing it a lot. Well, that's all. Thank you. And, and I definitely encourage you to, you know, um, so if you do have a lot more, reach out to, you know, our all our time about our email on the website. And thank you. And, oh, I don't have my mic on. Um, so uh, I encourage anybody in, who is still listening to email us with any comments. Um, and uh, with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned at 11.04. <laughs>